This meeting is called to order in, in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act. This meeting was included in a list of meeting dates sent to the Home News Tribune, the Star Ledger, and the Highland Park Planet on January 3rd, 2018, and was posted on the bulletin board of Borough Hall, 221 South Fifth Avenue, on January 3rd, 2018, and has remained continuously posted as required by law. Fire exits are to my left and to my right. Assistive listening devices are also available. And if you come up to speak tonight, please speak closely into the microphone. <coughs> Rosie, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Burl Mittler. Here. Councilman Fine. Here. Councilwoman Foster Dublin. Here. Councilman George. Here. Councilman Hirsch. Here. Councilwoman Kim Chohan. Here. Councilwoman Walkovitz. Here. Burr Attorney. Here. Burr Administrator. Here. Okay. okay um, at this point, um, I want to uh, take a moment to recognize some people that are sitting here today. As you may or may not be aware, the Borough Council ha uh, and I have made some changes to our uh, redevelopment organization here. Uh, and have taken the responsibilities of redevelopment agency into the council. Um, we could not have done that without the work that had been done prior to this by our redevelopment agency, uh, most recent chair being Roseanne Baru, who led us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. So um, I want to publicly thank you, Rosie, Bob, Ron, and the rest of the um, redevelopment agency for all the time and effort and for being able to get us to the point where we can now start really saying that we're, we have some plans, some developments that have made their way through the process and that we'll all be happy to see happening on, on Raritan Avenue in the not too distant future. So I want to thank you all and um, I have a little something for each of the three of you who are here tonight. Um, if you don't mind coming up. Mayor, can I add a few things? Oh, please do. Um, not only has it been their time and effort, but tremendous success. Um, right now coming in front of the planning board is a new development, the first one on the avenue. Uh, a, a, an actual build of something that hasn't happened in something like 50 years. Um, they have also, we, we've known about contamination at a certain site on the avenue for, for generations. And this is the first team that was able to, secu to secure any money in order to start the remediation of that, which will allow us to, to do redevelopment on that site. So thank you for that. And Certificates as well. 
anyone you know here are 90 years old or older if so uh, Middlesex County invites the seniors aged 90 and over to celebrate to a celebration of life in their honor each person who register may bring one guest to attend this celebration luncheon please contact the senior center to register as you must register in advance and this event will be held Wednesday May 9th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And just stay safe tonight and happy Easter to everyone that celebrates. And that's my report. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Councilwoman Welkovich, do you have a report? Um, uh, just really brief, I'm gonna stick to what's on the agenda tonight. I'd like to thank you, Mayor, for your words, and also uh, Councilwoman Foster Dublin. Thank you very much. Um, just very briefly, again, thanks to our redevelopment agency. They are not going away. They've all been redeployed <laughs> <laughs> to volunteer in other committees, in other capacity. Um, uh, I'd like to congratulate one of our, our newest restaurant, Bayleaf Grill. They've just been awarded $1,500 through our Main Street Facade and Awning Improvement Program. Uh, also on, on the um, agenda tonight uh, is congratulations to Elizabeth Chevry. She will become our new full-time clerk typist in our code department. This is after months as a, a, a successful temp in that department. And um, also thanks to Thomas Hillman for volunteering to uh, participate on our safe walking and cycling committee. He will be confirmed this evening. He's an amazing uh, data researcher um, at Rutgers and has already provided us with uh, uh, a lot of data with um, crash and safety information. And also Jeff Perl Perlman, who had been on the redevelopment agency, will be appointed now as alternate number one on our planning board. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Hurst, do you have a report? I do, Mayor, thank you. Um, tonight we're voting on a resolution that supports a bill, the New Jersey Safe um, and Responsible Drivers Act, uh, whose purpose is to enhance road safety by ensuring that all drivers, regardless of immigration status, are properly tested and licensed and are driving vehicles that are registered and insured. Uh, thanks to primary sponsors, Assemblywoman Annette Keanu and Assemblyman uh, Reed Gassiora for taking the lead, and I'm happy to report that our own Assemblywoman Nancy Pinkin is among the co-sponsors. Uh, New Jersey is home to nearly 500,000 uh, unauthorized immigrants. That's a fraction of the estimated 11 million unauthorized immigrants in the country. New Jersey being a driver-centric uh, state, uh, even though we're trying very hard in Highland Park for, for not to be driver-centric, but uh, it, it, is, it is our reality. And with limited mass transit options in the southern portion of the state, uh, the purpose of this bill is to enhance road safety by ensuring that all drivers are properly tested and licensed and are driving vehicles, again, that are registered and insured. Uh, the Highland Park Commission on Immigrant and Refugee Affairs and I worked hard on developing this resolution, meeting with legislators to address concerns, and working with our immigration advocacy community. Important to note is that any personal information collected would be subject to the same disclosure restrictions that apply to personal information collected from uh, applicants for driver's licenses. And that's among the, the concerns that we, that, that, that we listed in our resolution. Uh, under the bill, this information would not be con considered a public record and would not be uh, disclosed to any federal, state, or local government entity without probable cause or a valid warrant. Uh, this is the third time this bill has been introduced, but the first time it's been introduced under this new governor, so now is the time to get it done. Uh, I want to specifically thank uh, members of our uh, Commission on Immigration and Refugee Affairs, and I see uh, Leticia Cataldi and John Adler here from, from the Commission. Thank you so much for your hard work. I know that uh, you two specifically uh, uh, hashed out a, 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 a work session last, last Tuesday while we were up here, uh, so thank you so much for working on that. Um, and also uh, members from the, uh, the um, Alliance for Immigrant Justice, uh, which is a statewide advocacy organization who's provided us with, with 
just an incredible amount of technical support on these policies, um, as well as I think members of New Labor are here and um, uh, ACLU People Power um, and um, our our cl our clatch of, of of advocates that that uh, uh, that have, have worked on this. And you know, this is this is just one step. There's a lot more to do, but it's an important one. Um, so moving on, on March 16th, I had a great meeting with Dr. Cliff Lacey, former New Jersey Health Commissioner and current Highland Park resident, and who's also chair of our Mayor's Wellness Campaign. And we met with Jennifer Shikatis, uh, Assistant Professor and Educator in the Department of Family and Community Health Services at the Rutgers Cooperative Extension. We talked about partnering on health and wellness initiatives and other programs that fit into the goals of the Mayor's Wellness Campaign. We had a productive discussion and also identified grant opportunities. Stay tuned as this relationship develops. Uh, just to note, you'll remember that the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute named Highland Park a 2018 New Jersey Healthy Town by the Mayor's Wellness Campaign. And what this means is that it allows us uh, access to an Aetna Foundation grant that's administered through the Healthcare Quality Institute. Um, just some housekeeping. Tomorrow's Human Relations Commission meeting has been canceled due to the weather. Stay tuned for a new date we're looking for next week, but please stay tuned for that. Uh, the Commission for Universal Access met last night and discussed next steps for an inclusive playground, and we reviewed plans for the Teen Center. Thank you to Lieutenant Gary Panicella for his for his support for for, his, for help for, for for your insight and help on that one. Um, Highland Park gives a hoot. Uh, the, the the board of the Highland Park gives a hoot met March 12th, and we're preparing so to solicit applications for summer camp scholarships. Last year, we awarded several four-week scholarships, and depending on our finances, we may be able to award more. Please stay tuned as we finalize the application, which will be well publicized through Borough Channels. Thank you to everyone who attended our U annual Unity Day celebration on Sunday uh, at the Senior Youth Center. The mayor gave introductory remarks, and I was privileged enough to be MC as we enjoyed performances by bluegrass and folk singer Sheila Shukla, uh, the BU Dance Center, Amandala, the GLOW Program, and the Highland Park High School Choir. Mr. Ray Anderson, who penned Highland Park's official theme song, Stand in Unity, was unable to attend because he had a fever. So Sheila actually stepped in and learned the song on the fly. And um, I sang parts of it <laughs> in, in public. <laughs> I'm, more I'm more accustomed to singing in my car. Uh, but my first, few, my, I was, uh, my first musical performance as a member of the council, and I've been told already to keep my day job. <laughs> so that's that. Um, and then just on um, uh, a couple more things. On March 29th at 7 p.m. at the Senior Youth Center, please join the Highland Park Human Relations Commission Book Club, the New Brunswick Area NAACP, the Highland Park Parents of Students of Color, to discuss Carol Anderson's White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide. This powerful book examines obstacles against black progress in America and will be joined by Bill Davis, professor at Rutgers and branch historian for the New Brunswick uh, area NAACP. The book can be found at the Highland Park Public Library on Audible or on your, in, at your favorite bookstore. And um, just wanted to recognize um, uh, Human Relations uh, uh, Commissioner Julie Luck, who's in the audience today for, for, for organizing that. Uh, this is great and it's a real opportunity to really come together and discuss uh, thematic texts um, with people who you don't know. So it's a, it's a really good opportunity to, to, to hear other worldviews and to really dissect uh, important, uh, important books that, are, are that address themes in our community. Finally, if you haven't already, please, keep, uh, please get your official Highland Park Municipal ID. You can review the application and get additional information at www.hpborough.com. That's my report, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Council President George, do you have a report? Uh, I do, but uh, I will waive the report and I only want to cover three matters. Uh, first, in my regular veterans note, uh, nothing specific to report regarding events, but as you know, Saturday was St. Patrick's Day. Um, on that day, uh, for many years, um, it was celebrated in, in the parades of the five Sullivan brothers, and you may not know who they were, but they were five brothers who served in World War II on a cruiser which was sunk by the Japanese in 1942. Um, they're not mentioned too much anymore, but on St. Patrick's Day, uh, the day that they were always celebrated, Paul Allen, who was exploring the South Pacific, he was the co-founder of Microsoft, discovered the remains of their ship and it was declared a national cemetery. We lost all of the crew in 30 seconds. Second, I want to put out a warning. Uh, I got an interesting fax today at my office uh, from a law firm. Um, uh, so telling me that I appear to be the sole remaining heir of a $10 million insurance policy. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but um, I checked uh, just because uh, it appears to be targeting specific people. 
Um, and they are using a lot of live scam, uh, live information that's been stolen from law firms. Not mine, fortunately. But um, uh, just an alert uh, to everyone, the scam is going around. And if you call to verify, you'll actually get through on the email or the telephone. Um, so be, uh, be careful someone telling you that you appear to be the sole remaining heir of an estate. And finally, um, as we know, we are expecting our, we're in the middle of our fourth and expecting our fifth storm in, in March. Uh, DPW was scheduled to start a uh, branch and uh, clean up from the last storm, but unfortunately they will be busy plowing roads. If your place closes, if your school closes, if your office closes, if your place of work closes, uh, it's not an opportunity to go shopping downtown. Please try and stay off the road so we can keep them clear. Uh, and also be careful, it's supposed to be an extremely bad storm. Our crews will be out from the time it hits two inches until the time we get all the roads clear. So please give them your cooperation. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, and that reminds me, Councilwoman Foster Dublin, you read my mind. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Councilmember George jogged my memory. Um, we uh, have a warming center that will be at the Senior Youth Center next door, 220 South 5th Avenue, and in case anyone needs a safe, warm place to go, if you lost power during the storm, the center will be open. You call the police department and they will make arrangements so someone will be there to provide a shelter. It will be open from 7 p.m. at night until 7 a.m. in the morning. So if you need a facility for adults only, um, children will, um, we have another location which is the Reformed Church that will take families. But at the warming center next door, it's just for adults. And any questions, please call the police department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, borough Administrator, do you have a report? Not this evening. Okay. Borough, borough Attorney, <clears throat> do you have a report? No report, Madam Mayor. Okay. Um, just uh, the one thing I want to say before we open for public discussion is um, later on the Council will be voting on a couple of things I just want to address. One is the um, uh, introduction of the 2018 Municipal Budget and Tax Resolution. And the other is a, um, um, an introduction for, of an ordinance to amend the water and sewer ordinance, um, which we will be discussing. I want you to know that um, this year we've put some new financial controls in place um, so that we can better monitor our budgets as we m move through the year. Um, and um, what that has brought to our attention is the fact that actually the municipality has been subsidizing um, our water and sewer bills over the years, um, and we can't really continue to do that. Um, so um, you'll, you'll be hearing more about that as we start getting deeper and deeper into our budget. Um, tonight is a first reading and an introduction and I just want you to know um, that we are monitoring things much more closely than we ever did before. Okay, at that, now at this point, I'd like to uh, open for public discussion. I know there may be a lot of people who want to talk, and you came out tonight, so I'm going to ask you to limit your questions or comments to two, two to three minutes each, so that everyone who wants to speak can get a chance to speak. Um, and um, with that, um, if you have something you want to say, please line up on the side of the wall over there. Um, and um, uh, again, please limit your comments to two to three minutes so we can get to everybody. Um, and uh, don't forget to state your name and address, please. Good evening, Council Mayor. Can Monique you speak Coleman, yeah. Monique Coleman, 407 Lincoln Avenue, um, and I'm going to try to keep this to two minutes, as you said. I do want to thank you for um, opening up the conversation about the incident that involved my family this week, um, but I do want to recount it here tonight um, because I do feel like it's important. I still have concerns, um, and I also have some ideas for how to um, help support us moving forward. Um, I'm here tonight regarding a police-involved incident that occurred this past Thursday with my son, Amiri Tulloch. Um, and I also want to address the broader concerns that this incident has raised regarding policing practices and community police relations, particularly related to people of color and other members of the community that may be more vulnerable to um, or in police civilian encounters. 
I understand that by now most or all of you here are aware of the situation, but I will just briefly summarize what happened. My son Amiri Tella returned home from meeting with his former teachers and friends at the high school Thursday afternoon. When he got to the intersection of Madison and Lincoln near our house, he decided to take a picture of the intersection for a class project. Since he saw that no cars were coming, he walked into the middle of the street and took a picture then of the intersection. Then he proceeded to walk to our home, which is the second house in from the corner. And he entered normally without incident through the front door. A few minutes later, an undercover officer or detective knocked at my door. And to my shock, when I opened the door, I found several police cars in front of my house. Um, and that number quickly jumped to five within a minute. Um, and an undercover detective at my door asking me if a male had just entered my home. I told him, yes, it was my son. Then I saw another officer walk up be from behind on the side of my house, and at this point, I had to ask what was going on and why was there such an excessive police presence. The officer told me that he saw Miri taking a picture of a corner house, which raised his suspicion due to a rash of home burglaries, and the burglaries have hit a number of corner homes in the area. He then ended the conversation without even an attempt at an apology for disrupting my son and my family's um, life at that moment and swooping down our home with excessive police um, presence. Needless to say, this incident aroused the deepest concerns that I have as a parent, and I know that you've alluded to them earlier. Um, I have very valid concerns that I carry as a mother raising three black young men. Perhaps everyone in this room, and certainly the mayor, you're aware of the statistics of what happens too often to young people of color. We are disproportionately being profiling, profiled and exposed to excessive use of force at the hands of law enforcement. So for me, after the initial shock at the overwhelming police presence in my house, I couldn't help but wonder, very painfully, what would have happened if Amiri had been the one to answer the door. It also made me wonder how much of this was about him being perceived as not belonging in his own neighborhood. We do happen to be one of I don't even know a black family that lives in our immediate vicinity in our neighborhood. I have poured everything I have into my sons, as most parents would do, but I've done that with the added burden of knowing that in all things, wherever they move, they have to be twice as good. And even if they do act twice as good as their white peers, it still is not enough to keep them from experiencing discriminatory policing and harm that could cost them their lives. This incident with the HP Police Department was a very personal reminder of just how vulnerable and susceptible my sons are to unwarranted treatment at the hands of law enforcement as they make their way in this world. Not only did the incident upset me and my family, and it has troubled my mind ever since. That's why I can't talk about it now with, without getting emotional, so sorry. But my next door neighbor who witnessed the incident was equally upset and distraught about what happened her eyewitness account includes seeing the detective who knocked at my door draw his gun out briefly before the point at which I opened the door. The excessive police presence and aggressive stance that she witnessed struck her with fear for the safety of her own children because she didn't know what was happening and she knew that I was home because she saw my car. She and I both couldn't help but agree as we spoke later that evening that if her high school teenage son who has white skin had done the exact same thing that Amiri did, take a picture of the corner intersection, walk into the front door of his own home, he would not have been followed and responded to with such an excessive police presence, even in the midst of this, this um, heightened security state they're in over the burglaries. Yesterday I had a lengthy and very cordial meeting um, with the police chief, which I truly appreciate the time that him and a few officers were able to give me, and they shared the information that they had relative to my, uh, pertinent to my incident. I appreciated their time and their efforts to make me feel like he was fully disclosing all of the data that he had pertaining to this case. Unfortunately, there are aspects of the detective's accounts that do differ from mine, Amiri's, and my neighbor's um, testimony. And unfortunately, the video footage of the incident did not include the entire sequence of the detective's movements and actions leading up to me answering the door. So I will likely never get closure on these matters. All I know is that what my son did um, and what the police officers said he did. However, because my son was thankfully unharmed in this 
police encounter, I have the space now to focus not only on our particular incident, as troubling as it was, but rather on the broader issue of community concerns about biased policing in Highland Park that our experience has helped raise to the surface. One of the main takeaways that I got from the meeting yesterday with the police um, chief, Frisco, and other officers is that there is a huge divide between how many members of this community feel about and experience policing in Highland Park and the perception that the police have of their own uh, high marks or high performance in the area of racial profiling and biased policing. I know this because the chief uh, and officers who I met with expressed their belief that racial profiling does not exist in, Highland, in the Highland Park Police Department. They feel that the HPPD truly does exist in a bubble, untouched by all the discriminatory policing practices that have been documented in cities and towns throughout this country. But how can we as a community be assured that this is indeed the case in Highland Park? The chief showed me an internal log that they keep of traffic stops, but is this information periodically analyzed so that any discriminatory patterns that do exist can be identified, reported out, and dealt with? Police Chief Risco said that he wants to figure out ways to better communicate with and reach out to the, communicate, and to the community, and I can only take him at his word. But I'm asking the town council, as a first and crucial step to addressing the gap between the community and the police department, to seriously consider pursuing an independent racial profiling biased policing audit that includes also narratives, qualitative data from the community about their experiences. We all need to know what the data really says about policing in Highland Park so that areas of need can be addressed head on with comprehensive and institutional change. I cannot be assured still as a member of this community as much as I am integrated here and comfortable here, I still cannot be assured that my two teenage sons are comfortable walking around in this community on their own at 10 o'clock at night like I saw my neighbor's sons walking without being treated as a possible suspect. I truly thank you, the council, the mayor, everyone who's reached out to me personally, um, Councilman Hirsch, Councilman Wells, I really appreciate that. And I just hope that moving forward, you do take serious consideration to this request that I'm making. We need an audit. We need to know as a community that this really does not happen as the police department is telling us that it doesn't. Thank you very much. And also, I'm sorry, I just want to add that if body cams are provided, uh, all officers, detectives, if possible, let's move to the point where every detective, every officer has body cams and they're on at all times. Thank, Thank you, you, Monique. <laughs> stay, stay. Um, I, want, I, want to, I want to talk about some of the things you said. And um, as you know, I, I've asked for, your, for you to participate with me and other volunteers and police officers in this um, Committee of uh, Understanding. Um, there, there, first of all, there is there's no way that anyone other than you knows what's going on in your head and what you feel. And the same thing is true of the police officer. Um, you know, no, none of us could know what was going on in his head and how he's feeling as well. Um, as I said to several people, I'm the those of you who know me know that um, I'm the type of person who likes to take people who ha are at odds and sit with them in a room, door closed, and we're not leaving until we have a better understanding of where we're each coming from. Um, I know that's you know, much more difficult to do in this kind of a situation. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping that you will join me and other community members and members of the police department in this small group of us to talk about what's going on inside our heads and our bodies uh, when things like this happen from, from, from a resident perspective, um, especially a resident of color, and, and the police department, police officer's perspective as, as someone who is out there to, trying to protect us in, in his mind um, so that we can build together moving forward with a better understanding and, and, and a better future. If that, commit, uh, that committee will help us, help guide us in the future, and if that committee says they want to get some more information or, or whatever, you know, I would like those kinds of recommendations to come out of the committee. Um, and as I said before, I hope you and, and our officers um, will be willing to join me in, in making something good happen out of something that is disturbing to you and also to our police department. So thank you again. Thank you.
Okay, next. <laughs> Please state your name and address. I'm Anna Haleylock at 135 uh, North Fifth Avenue. I think it would be a gift to all of us if Ms. Coleman um, had the time and uh, desire to contribute to that, but it is absolutely not her job to help our borough understand and fight against racist police bias. Um, I cannot imagine having the grace that she must have had coming into this meeting and hearing in response to what happened to her son that you're going to increase reporting of crime, which sounds like you're justifying what happened, that you're going to talk to teens about how not to commit crimes and how to talk to the police. That is exactly opposite. So, so let me dig in here. I am here in support, clearly, of my friend and neighbor and her high school age son, who this past week was the victim of racial profiling by our police department. Please do not tell me, do not tell people who spent time coming to this meeting tonight that it was not racial profiling, if for no other reason than strategic optics. Hopefully far more than that. This was textbook racial profiling. A high school age boy taking photos of houses and trees, crossing the street and walking into the front door of his house is interpreted by a police officer as suspicious, and that interpretation leads him to questioning the child's mother at the door of their home, looking beyond her to try to locate the suspect, and something like three or four police cars showing up within minutes. Does anyone in this room think that that would be the response if my white son did exactly the same thing? Not for a second. Please do not tell us that Highland Park is a bubble immune to what every other city and town in this country faces where this never happens. It just did. And in the barely, uh, you know, I, wouldn't, I didn't come here this angry, but hearing what I've heard, I am way more angry than when I came. Okay? So let me, can I address some nope, of your nope, anger? No, I'm going to finish, and uh, you can address. Uh, 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 nope. uh, uh, no, 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 this no, is public comments. This, this is, is the people's public comments. Comment, and I would like to respond to some of what you're saying. You may saying. respond when I am done. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me, you're I not have, running this meeting. No, I want to hear you. No, but this is public you, comments. But this I is the people's time. Can I get a every, check on rules here? I Does expect. Mayor, I'm about to interrupt my, uh, our speaking time in public yes, comments. Yes. Now, Your I'm. Your optics, uh, go for it. Okay, so what I'm asking you is to be respectful. There is nobody up here that is disagreeing that in the world, there is racism, okay? There has been commentary th th by multiple members of this community in power that this was not racial profiling. I found that, I find that to be immensely okay. disrespectful, okay. as was the commentary at the beginning of this okay. meeting. Okay, I do and want, I like and those of, that's the point that you raised where you're making uh, comments about people here on, on the- Based upon what I heard and okay. what has been repeated but, in terms of other conversations. Okay. But there are the other, but involved. there are other things that were not reported tonight, okay? That with which I'm extensively familiar. No, okay. I don't know if you are because, um, I, you know, council. I would really like to continue. I would just let her continue. I would really like and, to continue. But I would I'd like, like to have everyone yeah, else who's here also be able to continue. Can it's not just about me. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. So there are there are several things that should immediately be said in an accountable. Uh, community with elected representatives that are concerned about this, um, things weighed in on. One, what training has the Highland Park Police staff completed in bias-free policing practices, not understanding, bias-free policing practices in 2017 and so far in 2018? State law applies here in terms of minimum hours of required training, but more specifically, what topics has that training covered, completed by what percentage of officers in field, and delivered by whom with what expertise in implicit racist bias, racist, racial bias, pardon me. Two, what is Highland Park's bias-free policing policy? I imagine many of us here would like a copy of that, and I can't seem to find it on the website. If it doesn't exist, will the council and mayor and police department commit tonight to developing and passing one? Three, what are the processes by which such profiling incidents are A, formally grieved by their targets, like my friend's son and family, B, investigated by the police and external entities to the police, and C, reported to the community. And four, finally, what has been the community's involvement in all of these various steps? So in anti-bias training development, in policy making, in formal grievance and investigation processes, and in reporting. So here's how Highland Park can be exceptional and can be 
a unique and positive bubble. We can take definitive, meaningful action right now before this kind of bias results in further violence. I would say what happened is violence in terms of emotional sense of safety and belonging in your own community. If we have not yet taken proper and full steps, ones that have become fundamental police practices around the United States, we must take those steps now. If we have taken them and they have not worked, and that's then what happened on Thursday possibly, we will work together now so that they do. We are here to be sure that you, that we, act so this does not happen in our community again. Okay, thank you. Now, now, uh, Mr. Gross, before you speak, I, I do want to, I do feel an obligation to respond to some of what you said. Um, first of all, for many years, I have sat on that side of the room. And I, I you know, it, it hurts me to think that um, you would think that we're not, uh, particularly me, not sensitive to what this, what's going on. I'm not going to talk too much about it anymore, but I want you to know the action that I had called for to have this committee so that we can work together on something is important. I, you know, I asked for, Bernice, uh, for Monique to participate with me and us on this program because I value her opinion. I can't, uh, I can't feel what she's feeling. I'm the mother of, of a, I have a son, but I didn't, I, my son is not black, and I can't imagine what it feels like to her. I need her input to us to make things better. I just want, I had to say that. Okay, Mr. Gross. Uh, my name is uh, Herb Gross. I live in uh, Adelaide Gardens, Highland Park. Uh, tonight, I am authorized by the Veterans Administration, the American Legion, and the Veterans of Foreign Wars, which I am a member, uh, to speak tonight about a benefit that concerns all the veterans, the men and the women that have served our country with honor and dignity. Uh, tonight, I would like to speak about a benefit that concerns every veteran. It is no cost to you. All you have to do is go down to the motor vehicle agency with a copy of your discharge, and you will get a new copy of your driver's license that has the veteran status on it. Uh, if there are any veterans in the audience tonight or your families, that would like to uh, take a look at this, I'd be more than glad to show it to you. And with the uh, permission from the chair, I would like to, uh, for a few moments, show, the, uh, show this card to all the members of our council. No doubt that they have members of their family, uh, loved ones, relatives, neighbors, that are veterans, and they would be able to relate th this information that I'm speaking about to them. Uh, with your permission, Chair. Sure. Is it free, Mr. Gross? It's pretty good. And they can all the shoulders to get veterans' benefits. Um, well, Mr. Gross, is show Mr. Gross, do you mind if while you're showing that to everyone, I ask the next person to speak? Do you mind while you're going around showing that? I'm going to ask, the, while you're showing everybody the card, uh, I'm going to ask the next person to start talking so we can keep well, them moving. I, yeah, I would like uh, the members of the council sure. to, to take a look at this. You, you also. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Very nice. Ah. If you have any Thank you. members of your family that would uh, that like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and Thank address. Thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, my name is Adam Gold. I'm not a resident, but I, I am a Great. teacher the at the one. high school, social studies teacher. Mm -hmm. And I didn't prepare remarks, but I um, just wanted to share a couple of things. First of all, I was a Miri's teacher, and um, not only is he one of the best students I've ever had, but he's also one of the best people I've ever known. Um, and I wanted to share a little anecdote. Uh, two years ago, Miri was part of uh, the school mock trial team, and his role on the team was to play the to play a police officer, and um, with the help of Officer Joe Curbelo, um, came in and graciously gave up his time and support and provided Amiri with a with a sense of what it might be like to be a police officer. And I kept thinking about those moments, those conversations that they were having, and how at that moment there was this opportunity for, for understanding and what those conversations would look like now. And what I would like to hear from the council too, I can't represent my school or, or the school district, but I can represent my classroom. And I would like to hear um, discussion of how uh, what's happening in the schools um, needs to be part of this conversation. Um, even today, conversation about the events last week trickle into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And every day, I feel that our job is to help our students seek understanding of the world and of themselves, but also of each other. And it is these events that uh, it is it is these events that I think create distance, and that distance is not um, is not bridged naturally. It's not bridged through a series of policy changes at the township level. It's bridged in the classroom through conversation, but conversation that happens within a community atmosphere with information and an appreciation for the truth. And I hope there is a recognition, whether it be on the committee that you discussed or the work that um, you spoke of, uh, Councilwoman, um, that this has an impact in our schools. And what's happening there is the foundation for how they understand each other, themselves, and the world for the rest of their lives. Very well said. And um, we, do, um, we do have an excellent re um, relationship with Dr. Taylor and the Board of Education. Um, we meaning the borough council and myself um, it, and I think you're absolutely right um, we need to find a way to bring this into the schools and bring bring more um, of what the policing aspects of life here in Highland Park is all about I, I'm going to ask Councilwoman Foster Dublin to speak in a moment but I I do want to talk about something she brought up a little earlier um, it was um, uh, not that long ago that we had that first uh, open public meeting she referenced um, when, where we invited the community to come in and talk with our police officers and our teenagers about, you know, what, what did the teenagers think about the police? That, I think, is the way we started it, Chief. Um, and and um, that opened up a whole conversation I did not want to at that meeting be on the dais because I wanted to, I didn't want it to be about the borough but about the community. And I, and I was um, sitting in the audience and um, it, it, it was enlightening to me to hear some of the conversation from the parents um, that really sparked um, the new uh, youth the officer that we have, Joe Curbelo, that now works with the schools and the teenagers, and also um, the teen center that Councilwoman Foster Dublin has been working towards for so many years. Um, it was the parents who got up after the, after the teenagers spoke and told us they wanted more involvement with, uh, with their children, their teenagers, and the police and could we help them find a way to make that happen? Um, that's how this teen center that um, the councilwoman has been 
working very hard to get open in time for the fall, which we're, it looks like it will be. Um, and that's where the new role in our police department of a youth off officer came from. We need to build on that, and, and our police department wants to build on that. Um, I'm going to let Councilwoman Foster Dublin also talk to that. Um, thank you for um, the observation and making that comment. A number of years ago, we had incidents, and one of the things that we did was we did had an independent study done and an evaluation of where we are and who we are as a community. And um, we had this independent study that was done, and we had about 35 things on the list that we had to improve. And um, last year, I discussed it with mayor and council. I said, it's, it has been a while, so it's probably time for us to revisit that and take a look at that checkoff list mm -hmm. and see where we need to go from the independent study that we brought someone in to do an audit of us, so to speak. During that time, we had put together a number of things. We had different groups that we formulated in town. One was called Bridge Builders, and we had um, people from all aspects of the community come together and to talk about how do we see race, how do we deal with race, and so what, are what are some of our divides? And we started looking at ourselves in that way, and maybe it's time again to revisit that conversation that we had 15 years ago and the changes that came out of the conversation that we made um, from here in the governing body to every single department um, in Highland Park. We, from that conversation came a lot of changes and we were able to move forward and some good steps. But as I said earlier, we're not perfect. Everything is not done, it's continuous improvement. And so based on what the mayor is saying about formulating a team and asking members of our community to be involved, this is going to be a way where we have maybe a student body that's attached to this. And then we can get real input. We have many boards and commission where we have students that serve. This is another community, uh, uh, way to connect again, to bring teenagers in and to hear that voice. Um, I believe that on our Human Relations commi Commission, we do have a police officer that serves on our Human Relations Commission. I'm not sure if we have a team that serves on our Human Relations Commission. Yeah, yes, we do. So we do have. So there's always pockets and opportunities to get more people involved and to, you know, our youth is our future, to, to pull them in and to hear what's going on from them and to listen to their concerns and have them have input in everything that we do. So not only with the teen center that we're putting together, not only with better community policing and having more officers engage and having conversations, but I think the more tentacles that we can pull together to get everyone involved, the better off we're gonna look at ourselves and say, okay, we have gone, 15 years ago we did the study, check, 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 now let's look at another list that we're gonna look at for the next five to 10 years to see how we can continue to improve. Unfortunately, Incidents like this is not going to go away in our country because there is a, it's coming from the top these days, the craziness that's going on. And with all the crazy stuff that we see going on, you know, if we don't have, um, if we, everything starts locally, politics is local. So we have to make sure that in our town of Highland Park, we're setting that example, we're paving the way and we're doing the right things. So when our children go out into the greater world, that they can cope, they'll have the, the coping mechanisms to cope. I went through that when my son graduated in 2012. I was worried stiff because I'm like, okay, he's moving away, he's moving to New York City to live, it's a different world. It's a totally different world, but he needed all those coping mechanisms and skills so he can cope. So yes, I'm concerned with everybody else's children, I'm concerned with all, but I'm particularly concerned with black and brown children because they see it and they face it every day. Right. Thank you. Please state your name and address. My name is Jessica Hunston. I live at 304 Montgomery Street. And first of all, I'm here as a member of New Labor in support of the driver's license resolution you will be voting on. And um, there are several members of New Labor that are here. Um, this is a really important measure for the New Labor community and all of New Jersey. And I'm grateful for your leadership on this. 
Um, now I'd like to switch gears and address some concerns as a resident of Highland Park related to policing. The ACLU People Power Middlesex County Group has been exploring practices and policies of various police departments through documents obtained via the Open Public Records Act, OPRA. In Highland Park, we have gathered data on traffic stops, use of force, pedestrian stops, and in some cases, arrest reports or dash cam videos. In a preliminary analysis of traffic stops and use of, report, use of force reports from January 2016 to November 2017, which we have sh shared with several members of the Council and the Human Relations Commission, we have found some findings that could suggest patterns of racial bias. If there are, um, if there are questions about the analysis of this data that I will share, um, I and other members of the ACLU People Power Middlesex County Group would be happy to sit down and review the analysis. It is my understanding that the Highland Park Police Department voluntarily collects data on traffic stops by race, ethnicity, and gender with the purpose of reviewing and analyzing it in order to identify any possible racial profiling incidents. Therefore, I'm sure our findings, based on analysis of citation rate and comparison to Highland Park racial demographics, won't be surprising to the police department. When taking into consideration Highland Park racial demographics, black drivers are stopped and cited at three times the rate of white drivers. Specifically what this means is blacks make up 6% of the population of Highland Park, but accounted for 18% of traffic stops and 16% of citations during the time frame I just mentioned. Now let's turn to citation right. This specifically refers to how someone stopped is given a citation. The citation rate for whites in Highland Park over the past two years has been 46%. This means that if you were a white driver, on average, 46% of the time you were stopped, you received a citation over the time frame I mentioned. However, if you are Asian and were stopped, on average, you received a citation 64% of the time. Taking into account the population of Asians in Highland Park, Asians are cited 2.5 times the rate of whites. Another data point we explored was use of force reports. According to the data received, there were 19 incidents of use of force in Highland Park in the time frame from January 2016 to October 2017. Five were redacted due to involving individuals with a psychological condition or they were a juvenile. So in this analysis, they have been left out. In the 14 remaining reports, use of force could include compliance hold, hand fists, knee to abdomen, kicks, or use of a chemical agent. 11 of the use of force in, um, reports incidents occurred with people of color. While the borough is approximately 64% white, 78% of incidents of use of force involve people of color with 71% of use of force incidents involving blacks. Anytime I analyze data, I try to understand the limitations of the data. For example, summary data doesn't look at individual cases and try to understand what happened in each case, which is clearly important. Several of these use of force reports need to be looked at more closely, which we intend to do. We also know that when we do analysis compared to population, for example, not everyone who was stopped or received a citation is a resident of Highland Park. However, this preliminary analysis of data can help identify trends or patterns which should lead us to ask questions and reflect upon practices and policies. Given these data, as well as recent disturbing incidents, one would think that the Highland Park Police Department would be concerned, and the council, would be concerned about the racial patterns that its officers and policies are producing. The community is telling you, and your numbers confirm, that there are clear racial disparities in, in both traffic stops and use of force, among other policing issues mentioned here tonight. So my question to the council is, and the Highland Park Police Department is, what specifically are you going to do to address these disparities? So Jessica, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't think I, I don't think I was one of the people that received that report, uh, that your report from the ACLU. If you would um, please sure. get me a we copy of it. That. And then I would like to ask that um, um, the Public Safety Committee yeah. um, also. We've talked about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, and and then if we have questions, certainly we'd like. And to we we we're not finished, so I, that's why I said it's a preliminary analysis. So, but we can certainly share that with you. Okay. There's a group of residents that are concerned about it clearly. Okay. We Thank did you. meet with Jessica and. Uh, we did meet with Jessica to discuss some preliminary parts of, these, of this report. She, at that time, advised us she was not finished, and we supplied her with some additional information that we have about our practices and training that we provide our police officers here in town with. So 
that would be a part of her report while it's come. Yes, when it's and, and someone so you did meet with the public safety committee. Is that <coughs> yes? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anna Perez, 344 Becker Street. I'm here today to lend support to Monique Coleman, who had uh, the courage uh, to uh, share her experience uh, very publicly and to come here today to uh, give testimony. I think now that she has shared this traumatic experience, the burden should not be on her and her family. I think now the burden is on us. So there's uh, an incident that I think clearly exposed racial bias in policing. Um, it's not an isolated incident. There are documented patterns of um, unjust police practice in Highland Park. I think you know they go a long time. Much has been done to remediate them, but much remains to be done. The first step in undoing racism is acknowledging bias in our institutions and in ourselves. So as I said, the burden is now on us and I think we are in the position to uh, request an investigation for this particular incident. So I, I am happy to volunteer for committee work, but I think that's not enough. I think we have clear, uh, you know, we, we are in the position to request an investigation, um, and many of us would like that to proceed. Uh, um, and then we need to well, simultaneously do some work as a community to keep on doing racism to the extent that we can because it's much wider than us. Um, I think you remember Amir well. He was yes. here two years ago. He was invited uh, to talk about the Roots Project in this, um, in this, uh, to this body and he's uh, uh, an amazing person, but that's not the point, right? Um, he, in leaving, to go to, uh, to return to, to school, he asked us, he asked his mom not to keep the focus on him, uh, but to make it about others that also experience um, such a, a traumatic um, incidents and bias. So I hope you will keep this um, you know, ask in mind when you proceed with the work, and again, I don't think committee work uh, is sufficient. It is necessary, but it's not sufficient in this particular situation. Knowing that it's not an isolated um, incident, I want to remind you in closing, as a member of Highland Park Parents of Students of Color, which is where I got to know Monique, and probably I would never have met otherwise, but it gives you some pause. It was created uh, three years ago after parents reported uh, similar incidents like their kids being followed by you know, police cars around town. So that was very much the concern of people that, that, earth, that, you know, that created this group. So, right. so there's patterns and we, we can't just dismiss them. We need right. people to, to give testimony. I have a very a, a different unrelated um, public safety concern. So I want to bring it to you. I hesitated because it appears trivial in comparison, but um, uh, so, so before you go on, yeah. I just want to, um, uh, the, the, if there are members of the parents of students of color here, I know that our officer, youth officer, uh, offer, uh, Sergeant Corbello, um, has been anxious to be able to become more familiar with you and meet with you so that we can build some bridges, and I'd, I would love to see that happen. We, we have done this work. I mean, we started talking to Officer Corbello. He was very, you know, he, he reached out to us, but there's, you know, I don't think an officer who is um, white um, with a Hispanic heritage understands that the relationship that black youth have to guns, and for us the, 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 the problem was guns, like Officer Corbello cannot come into one of our meetings with a gun, it's an issue. <coughs> so that kind of broke the conversation. We're very grateful to his reaching out, but we were saddened that there was this, you know, this, we couldn't get, we couldn't talk, because he didn't understand the gun is a problem. He said, it's part of my uniform, and, and that's fine. But then we cannot talk with a police officer that has a gun 
in our meeting. That, so that's, that's so, so we again, can, we, let's try to work something it's, out it's on that. It's another issue. So, yeah, so yeah. can I speak briefly about the yes, public safety issue? Yes, please. So this has to do with the public fair, with the uh, street fair? I'm sorry, yes. before you continue, <laughs> I want to be, I want to be clear in my mind. You're saying the gun is an issue and he's white Hispanic, so you'd prefer to speak to an African American? <laughs> No, That's what you're saying? I think that he didn't know the fact. I don't know that his heritage, although he is Hispanic, uh, he, although he's a minority himself, and Hispanics are also racially profiled in this country, um, he didn't understand that black so kids you're saying that would the, react. Okay. Please. You're saying that the gun was a problem, not so much him and his Hispanic the, heritage. The gun was a problem. No, yeah. no. I thought that the fact that he is Hispanic is definitely a plus in this conversation, right? Uh, as a okay. parent, he could be a parent, uh, a member of our group. Anyway, let's, it's not about Officer Covello or any officer, except those who were involved in this <coughs> incident. But, you know, we have done some of this work and it reveals some, you know, there were mm -hmm. problems that we confronted okay. in, in this conversation. But we have had this conversation. Okay. We have been working on this. Now, for public safety, the street fair, my uh, son was hit by a, a, the, a pole of a tent that flew in the air. So the pole was not secure. It was the pole of, uh, uh, so last year in May, uh, it was uh, the stand of a political organization well known to all of you. Uh, <laughs> the a gust of wind uh, flew, uh, made the canopy flew in the air. He was hit in the head. I have the ER. He was, you know, taken care of by the ambulance who was there, taken to the hospital. He got the CAT scan, uh, $4,000 bill that the insurance paid for truly most of it. I just don't want this to happen again. Right. I, I know that there's uh, a group that organizes the fair, right there. but whatever the town can do to make sure that participants, local participants, secure their tents, the poles correctly, right. to prevent such accidents would be uh, really, um, so I'm going to ask actually Councilwoman uh, Welkovitz, who is the liaison to the Main Street organization, they're the ones who run that, um, to get to them on that. Yeah. And it's the first time I report this. I, I didn't report it. Yeah, right? yeah, it's so the first we're hearing. Uh, but uh, you, but I felt that, the, and again, I felt the contrast between what you know, the mom of a blackie has to worry about and what I have to worry about, the canopy possibly flying in the air. Right. It's quite striking to me and I realize my, you know. Okay. Okay, so Su Susie, you'll be able to take that. Of course. Yeah. You may want to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Amrica, 11 Sparkle Avenue. Amiri Tulloch, 18 years old. A student at Phillips Andover Academy, a future student of Columbia, a lover of hip hop, Star Trek, and photography, and one of my closest friends. Over 20 students from Highland Park High School are here in support of him tonight. I'm, in, I'm here tonight in support of him because he is an amazing person, someone I look up and aspire to be. I know he's destined for great things, and uh, he's just one of the greatest people I've ever met. But in an instant, with one piece of miscommunication, one wrong move, all that could have been over, and I would have lost an amazing friend. And as a student of Highland Park High School, I would just like to say that this will not be tolerated. The students of Highland Park are all very forward thinking, and we do not tolerate actions like this. It can be said that this wasn't racial profiling, but quite frankly, we do not believe that. We've seen the body cam footage, we all watch the news, we know what happens. And as a friend of Amiri, as a person of color, as a student, and a future voter, I just have a few questions. Why is this happening in Highland Park in 2018? Who's next? I'm a person of color. Is this going to happen to me? What's being done to make sure that this won't happen in the future? This is an irresponsible incident and it cannot happen again and we will not allow it to happen again. Okay, um, thank you. Um. Chief um, or Councilwoman Foster D Dublin, would um, you like to report on any of the other stops that occurred um, regarding these uh, incidents? I'll let the chief take that one. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for all coming out. I appreciate all your comments, and it will certainly be taken all into consideration. Uh, the statistics, if I could get a copy, I'd love to see that. I'd like to take a look at Chief, it. Chief, can you speak a little louder, please? <laughs> yes, I can. Um, for me to say it wasn't racial profiling is not obviously going to be popular. We are out there. Ordinarily, as I told uh, Ms. Coleman, I thought we had a very good meeting yesterday. Uh, I let her li see. She has everything I have. She saw the videotape, the audio of it. Uh, I spoke to the uh, detective. His, uh, there are some differences in versions that I don't think we're ever going to resolve, as you said. Um, I've asked for her help or anyone else. We're willing to take any suggestions to improve relations with our community. We have taken steps uh, since I've been chiefed with different programs. Um, I do hear that there are some incidents of, uh, that may have went on. What I, I don't know if you all know, I do want to put it on the record, that if there are any incidents, they need to come to my attention. And there's a mechanism. You call, you can be uh, 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 anonymous, you can do what you'd like. Um, and we would, we're obligated under the Attorney General's guideline to investigate this. Now, many people feel it's not fair police investigating the police. If you don't trust us, you go to the, attorney, to the uh, county prosecutor, Attorney General, DOJ, whatever you feel is appropriate. I do, I, I, my primary concern is protecting everyone in our community. Um, with this re recent rash of burglaries, uh, we have extra help out there to try. We're trying to uh, resolve this before someone gets hurt. These are particularly forceful burglaries. Um, we're afraid, and in this particular incident, as I said to Ms. Coleman, you know, whether I'm believed or not, one of the concerns was if, if this was a bad guy, and he wasn't. I hear nothing but good things about him, Mary, particularly from Officer Cabello and my other officers who know him. Um, they didn't, this detective didn't know who he was, so one of the concerns was he could be hiding behind the house or he could break into the back of the house endangering the resident. One of our concerns is that one of these burglaries is gonna turn into an occupied home and things could get worse. So, are we perfect? No, are we doing our best to, uh, to try to catch the person? Uh, we are. Um, Given that, we are getting much more, uh, many more reports of suspicious people. To date, we've had 46. Uh, some white, some black. I don't have the break, I don't have the breakdown. I wasn't able to get that. Uh, but we do respond. This one was officer initiated, granted. Um, but we've had 46 to date. Most of them are unfounded. The people belong there. One was a real estate agent, whatever. But we're, we're checking every lead. And if this wasn't the case, as I said to uh, uh, Ms. Coleman, I doubt if uh, a Mary would have been stopped. We wouldn't really particularly care uh, unless he's taking pictures. But if it was an, of an infrastructure, if any of us are taking pictures of that, we're probably going to be questioned if you're taking pictures of the Holland Tunnel or something like that because of today's society. So. Excuse me? How many what? We don't uh, have. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask. We have we have rules that we have to follow here at council. So if you have something to ask the chief, you can come go on the line and ask him after. I I don't know how many responded, but generally we don't have five police guards. I wish we did. Okay, there's other things going on. I don't want to compromise the integrity of the investigation. I did tell Ms. Coleman of more information that I'm willing to share publicly. Because again, I don't want to compromise the investigation, which is still ongoing. But generally, that you're not going to see that in Holland Park because we don't have that type of uh, personnel. Um, this is just, uh, unfortunately, uh, what we're facing now with the burglaries and what occurred here, and here we are tonight. Uh, as I said to Ms. Coleman, uh, who was very respectful, and we had a good conversation. I'm happy to meet with anyone and take any suggestions on how to how we can better uh, communicate with the public and, and react and know other people's feelings. And then they can know ours, too. Uh, when I first started, we didn't have uh, any relationship with the Community Relations uh, Committee. And now we, I think we have a pretty good one. Uh, Lieutenant Panicello is on there. It stops rumors, misinformation. They know what, what's going on with us. We know what's going on with them. And it just, I'm a big, promoter of communication, and if anyone has suggestions, and some of them were made, 
you know, if, if, if it will work, I'm all for it. So, but that's where we're at at this point. Okay. Thank you, Chief. State your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Dan Beatty. I live at 304 Montgomery Street. Um, can, can you raise the microphone? Oh. <laughs> you should be able to just squiggle it up. Um, let's see if that's good enough. Okay, maybe take it out. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Dan Beatty. I live at 304 Montgomery Street. Um, first time here to support the driver's license resolution you'll be voting on tonight. <laughs> Um, and second, I'm also a member of the ACU, ACLU People Power Middlesex County Group that has been examining policing practices, uh, policies and practices in different police departments. And I was one of the members who met with uh, Council Member uh, Foster Dublin and, and uh, Council Member Hirsch. Um, uh, the police chief actually just mentioned the 2016 Attorney General Directive. Uh, and I understand that after receiving initial training at an accredited police academy, uh, Highland Park officers were required to complete five hours of continuing education by the end of 2017, and at least three hours a year after that. A list of topics covered are, are lengthy in the um, directive, uh, but they include de-escalation techniques, cultural diversity awareness, racial profiling, and implicit bias. Um, and from a report um, uh, provided uh, from the police chief through the council members, um, uh, it, it was clear that um, officers have received a number of, of different trainings um, <coughs> around um, cultural awareness to sensitivity to different groups, um, and that these trainings have been provided by volunteers from the community, um, from different community groups. Um, I'm, I'm interested in learning how these trainings align to the uh, Attorney General Directive, uh, namely de-escalation techniques, racial profiling, and implicit bias. And while I understand the importance of cultural awareness and sensitivity training, that is significantly different uh, than training on racial profiling and bias. And I don't think that's necessarily been clear in some of the conversations that have happened tonight. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit more uh, about that in a moment. Uh, it is also my understanding that in August 2016, it became a requirement for the State Department of Law and Public Safety to develop cultural diversity training materials and an out online tutorial for local police chiefs who are themselves required to draft a cultural diversity action plan. Uh, I'd like to know how we can obtain a copy of the cultural diversity action plan. That might be a, a step in communicating with the community um, and the ways in which it addresses um, some of the previously uh, um, mentioned topics around racial profiling and implicit bias. I know that, you, uh, that the police department collects data on traffic by race, ethnicity, and gender because I have their data um, uh, and we have been analyzing it. Um, in order to identify any possible racial profiling incidents. Um, I'm interested in learning more about how frequently it's reviewed and how it's analyzed um, and what patterns they're looking for because as previously uh, stated, uh, our analysis of this data has raised a number of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know why those concerns haven't been identified within the police department. Um, um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, during a recent review of the 2002 Highland Park Community Relations Task Force, this was um, something that was mentioned by Councilwoman um, uh, Foster Dublin. Um, as we reviewed this, um, there were a number of different interesting recommendations. One such uh, example was the Civilian Complaint Review Board um, that doesn't seem to have been implemented, but it sounds like this. Um, committee that, that you're establishing might be able to serve something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but I think a, a place for civilian complaints to, to be um, filed and, and um, understood and, and dealt with. Um, and I think that might be something um, uh, to, to think about as a part of that committee. Um, but it, the, the reason it was actually um, recommended was it was supposed to ensure a complete, thorough, and impartial process. Um, and I don't think, I think from the community's uh, perspective that uh, the community necessarily has been a part of that process um, or that it's necessarily been impartial to this point. Um, in many ways, Highland Park has been a leader on important policies like passing the inclusive resolution last year and even the driver's license resolution tonight. Therefore, it is really upsetting to see resistance to addressing issues of racial bias in our police force. Uh, as someone who actually researches racial bias in education, 
uh, I can say this is actually a very complex issue, and I think it's more complex than it's being made out to, to be even tonight. Um, racial bias is not something that you can necessarily attest to having or not having. Uh, the nature of implicit bias is that we as individuals are not aware of it, uh, but act on internalized stereotypes. Due to the nature of how racial bias works, asserting that you have no racial bias is actually counterproductive and likely a sign that racial bias is at work. Furthermore, systemic bias becomes visible through patterns of behavior rather than single incidents. So the review of data for single incidents is likely not going to um, provide many results unless you look for patterns. Therefore, as concerned residents, we must insist that a police force that shows racial disparities in traffic stops, use of force reports, and the personal stories that have been mentioned tonight um, needs to be held accountable and do the work of uprooting racism and racial bias personally and institutionally. So, so thank you very much. Um, I, wa I want to um, just comment on a couple of things and then ask the police chief or uh, Councilwoman Foster Dublin if they have anything. Um, uh, the, the racial bias um, statistics that you have and you've quoted and, and, and racial bias has, is a concern to all of us. And I know particularly with the police chief, he and I and Councilwoman Foster Dublin often talk about um, you know, making sure that we are being as objective as possible in everything that we do regarding our stops and all. But that may not be the reality. I, I don't have those numbers, and clearly you have been able to look at them. The, the other thing that you mentioned, um, a place for people to have complaints. Now, when I first started on council, the Human Relations Commission was one of my, in my bucket. Um, and I remember from them and Councilman Hirsch, uh, I don't know if you've looked at their charter lately, um, but they, they, there is a police officer on the Human Relations Commission, but that is the place that people are encouraged to go to if they have any complaints or comments. I don't think that's very clear to the community. Okay. And I don't think that has been communicated to right. the community. And, and, right, and so I think, you know, We've talked a lot about communication, and, and frankly, the reason that I first brought up the number of incidents that were occurring in town was because of a conversation I had with Monique when she told me she didn't even know about this. And, and though we thought we were communicating, um, apparently not. Um, and, and that is a, an area that I think we, as a governing body, have to address on several issues, including that people can go to the Human Relations Commission with complaints like that. So, so you know, I thank you for raising that. Um, Chief, did you have anything? Uh, just to follow up on uh, clear training. You, you may want to get to the mic. And just to follow up on that, that clear training that was mandated recently by the Attorney General's office, uh, he uh, then, Attorney General Perino mandated that the 500 agencies in the state undergo training in racial bias and de-escalating violent encounters, um, and it had to be done by the end of last year. We all, including myself, took that, and it's going to be continuing education. And I can't uh, back that up more than, than that. I, I, I am a proponent of that. And I'm not, I don't want to take it like I'm selling us because uh, I don't know if I'm, if that would make any sense here, but I, I think I'm a proponent of it. I think we've been ahead of the uh, curve uh, since I started. We have conducted cultural sensitivity programs. Um, they're more um, in tune with Highland Park residents because a couple of things. One, budgetary uh, constraints keep me from sending people to all type of schools, not to mention I need people on the road. Secondly, when you send a, an individual officer, an individual officer gets the benefit. So I came up with an idea to bring in people that I can get, and, and this is an invite for anyone else who has any expertise. And we brought in, so my officers are more uh, uh, familiar with people's customs and mores, and I feel that we can maybe better serve our community. 
Uh, we have uh, uh, we brought in a rabbi for Orthodox Jewish religion, um, African American culture conducted by the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Officers, Noble. Uh, we brought uh, these people in several times because I get new officers and people retire. Muslim religion, Asian, Indian, Chinese culture, LGBT community by New York City Police Department, uh, Southeast Asian uh, women's culture, autism training, aphasia training, whatever I can get for free that seems to make sense, I'll take. That's an open invite. Anybody have anything of value? We brought in, again, before the CLEAR training, talked about de-escalation and handling people with emotional issues. I asked acute psychiatric services from Rutgers Mental Health to come in and address our officers. Cop to cop for officers who may have issues on their own. Um, so if anyone has any more ideas and uh, the cost uh, meets my budget, which isn't much, Bring it forth, and if it fits, uh, we'll certainly uh, take care of that or see if we can promote it. But the CLEAR training has been mandated, but that's relatively new, but it's a good thing. Chief, you may want to sit just, closer to here so that if you get called up to mic, you don't have to walk all the way over. I, I just want to add to the, the report that we mentioned before that was done in 2002. Those are some of the things that was highlighted in the report that we had started putting in place back in 2003. So the latest CLEAR training program, we have been ahead of the curve. Not that we're patting ourselves on the back, but we have been ahead of the curve because we know what our community said to us and what we wanted was to do to address some of the issues. So we came out ahead of the curve before the AG put that in place. And we have worked diligently to find professionals in each area to provide us the kind of training that we need to address what was called out in the report and what we see that we need to, in, to create a better society with our police department, our residents, and for you know, each and every one of us. So we have been working hard, but as I said, there, there's a time now that was 15 years ago, let's go back and take a look at ourselves and see what we can improve upon. So it's always about continuous improvement. Thank you, Elsie. Um, I'm going to ask that anyone has, who has already spoken wait till later's um, uh, public se open public session. Um, but anyone who's standing there who has not yet spoken, please step up to the mic. I'm not as tall. Hi, my name is Katherine Burton. I live at 40 Cedar Avenue here in Highland Park. Uh, many of you, even on the council, know me and know my son. M I am a parent of student of color. You might not be able to tell by looking at me. Uh, but I do have a 10-year-old black son who is in fourth grade. I just wanted to lend uh, a different perspective to one of the perspectives that I've heard voiced uh, by the council tonight. I am actually more interested in my son having less involvement with the police. Um, more involvement with the police is not a goal for me. Uh, and so I just want to clearly state that to you so that you hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in him being in centers in the community where police are, uh, not because I don't have respect for your job. I have the utmost respect for your job. I served as um, on the Middlesex Mobile Response Team for, ch for children for over 10 years. I'm actually just finishing up being a trainer for the New Jersey Children's System of Care, specifically in cultural competence and nonviolent crisis prevention. I talk to people who go out into the community to see people with severe and men persistent mental health challenges, as well as behavioral challenges, and they go out to see these people without the aid of guns. So I have, I have some respect for the challenge that's presented to our police force. However, I know that here in New Jersey, we have, we have the highest rate of disparity in the nation in terms of our youth who are involved in juvenile justice. Currently, we have 222 youth who are locked up in our juvenile justice facilities, only 18 or 19 of whom are white, the rest of whom are kids of color. So we are not in a bubble. I have lived in Arkansas. I have lived other places south of the Mason-Dixon line. My hometown is Flint, Michigan. I'm, I'm very aware of the challenges placed uh, that are part of race in our country. Um, but this place is no different. And it's one thing to not be racist, and it's another thing to be actively, intentionally, with resources, anti-racist. It requires a completely different set of policies. It requires a completely different mindset. 
and that is the town where I want to live. Right now, I heard... Two things happened when I heard about what happened with Mo Monique and Amiri. It was Thursday, right? Uh, it, was, we, it wasn't snowing, thank God. Uh, and I heard my neighbors outside playing. My son had been upstairs playing video games, and I thought to myself, he's going to go outside, right? But then I read about what happened with Monique and Amiri. My son is 10. He's 5 feet tall. He wears a size 10 shoe. I have had basketball coaches of the opposing team ask me to produce his birth certificate to prove he is the age that he is. So I thought to myself, no. Emmett will not be going outside to play at dusk with his white friends because I don't know what will happen if he takes out his new cell phone and snaps a picture. And that is not a risk that I am currently willing to take. The second thing that happened was he came down from upstairs after playing video games and he said, Mom, tomorrow is Friday. It's the only day of the week that one of you guys will be home when school ends at 2.30. I'm in fourth grade, and you know the thing that happens in Highland Park in fourth grade is you can walk home from school. <laughs> Independence. He said, Mom, can I walk home from school? We live a straight shot to Bartle down Benner. It's four blocks, right? And I had to explain to my son why no, he would not be walking home from school. I don't care if he's 10. I don't care if he can navigate the intersections appropriately. I don't care if he has his own phone. I don't care if somebody is waiting for him. He is not walking home from school if Amiri cannot walk home from school without the police, without the fear of the police, thinking that he might be suspicious. I know other friends of mine who have white kids who are worried about their kids walking home from school because they might be abducted or raped or molested, and I have to verbalize to my son why I will not let him walk home from school because I'm concerned about what will happen if the police stop him. And that is not why I pay taxes to live here. So I hope that you hear my alternative perspective that I actually hope that he never meets the police officers. Not because I don't think they're great guys, but because I hope that he never has to experience the trauma of being a black youth who comes into contact with the, pol the police. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bruce Morgan, 222 Banner Street. I am the president of the NAACP New Brunswick Area Branch. I'm the second vice president for the New Jersey State Conference of the NAACP. I'm the child of a law enforcement officer. I have a son that was profiled in Highland Park. I've been profiled, which is a sad state of affairs to hear about America. I walked in this room tonight, and something happened to me that it just it, it turned my stomach. I had a white parent, you know, who I'm pretty friendly with, said, yes, my child would like to interview you to find, you know, how do you be a parent of a black kid? What, you know, what's the secret of raising successful black children? It's no different from the white people. It's no different from the Asians. You know, this is the mindset of America. But what I think we need to do, and it's said that we had this task force, I was part of this task force in 2002. Somewhere along the line, we stopped being that task force. You know, we get to the point, and this is, you know, Highland Park is not a bubble, by no means. Um, perhaps the ills of the world don't affect us as much, but whatever's out there in that world is here. <clears throat> you know, and that's what, <laughs> A lot of times people forget. You know, when we had that task force in 2002, you know, in hindsight, we should have that task force every year. You know, and let, you know, let it become a part of our culture that we learn this. And we can become the ripple in the pond to push it out in the world. You know, but we can't forget the fact that this is America. And I'm looking at this beautiful audience here about these problems. This isn't anything new to anybody in this room. Mm -hmm. What have you done about it until you stepped into this room tonight? What have you done about it? 
you know, with the NAACP and what I was taught, the first thing you want to do is talk. So if you have any problems, and fortunately I live in a community where I can call the chief by his first name. But we also have serious discussions about the situations going on. You know, and this is what I think we as a community need to do to really push this envelope a little further. You know, don't forget about this next week, two weeks from now. Have this discussion in September. Have this discussion in 2020. Have this discussion on your jobs. You know, let this be part of, of you and changing the culture of this racism and hate in America. The NAACP here, we're here to serve the community. You know, I serve this community, number one, because I live here and this is my community. But I also have other resources at my, at my hand to try to help make this a better community. We have a hotline. If you feel you've, you haven't been treated fairly and you don't want to talk to the chief, talk to me. You know, talk to council people up here. You know, don't sit on it. We have services for police training. And Giles is part of our training circle, so right. you get him, you get him again. You know, we have different services for the schools. You know, use the resources you have. You know, but don't just say, oh, it was fine and everything is good. It's all good. Because your kid doesn't get, doesn't get profiled. It may happen. You know, I pray to God it doesn't happen to my kids. I still get profiled. I'm 64 years old. I go to the store, I get followed. I mean, if I stole something, I couldn't run out. <laughs> so, no, but, but it's a shame that, you know, this is the country we live in. You know, we have a community here that is better than that. And we just, the thing is, it's not going to be better than that until we all take a hand to make sure it's better than that and it stays better than that. Yes. It's up to us. So don't, don't walk out here at night and say, yeah, get on the phone and get on Facebook and Instagram and start talking all this stuff, because that's what I call Facebook muscles. I've heard so many people saying so many things on Facebook, and I'm saying, where were they in demonstrations? Where were they when different you know, events came up? Where were they? But they get on that computer and they, and they have, they, they Hercules. <laughs> you know, you're laughing, and, and you, it's funny, but it's a, it's a shame. It's, the truth. it's really a shame. This is how you have these systematic problems going through year after year after year after year, generation after generation after generation. This lady has a black son, and she says she can't let him walk home, you know, alone. It's true. And, you know, it's because the ills of the world. You know, and I, I do have to say, you know, people are probably going to resent me for this. The Highland Park Police Department has had been one of the best departments I've dealt with. And I've got to say also, the Highland Park Police Department, they come to me because they've had problems. And we sit down and work it out. We just haven't worked out everything. You know, so this thing will happen to Mary, you know, when it happened to Mary, I said it couldn't happen to a better kid. This kid is so good, he plays hockey. <laughs> you know, I'm saying that's what, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, but we have to we have to make this a better world. We have to support our council. We have to f support our police. And by supporting, if you have a problem with them, you tell them. Right. If you don't want to tell them, if you want to file a complaint, see me. Because mm -hmm. I can get you to file a complaint. Your name don't have to come to it. But if you have a problem, don't sleep on it, because your children, children may have that problem. So take care of your business now. Do what you have to do. And Mayor, I'm with you. That's why I said, when you asked about that, that, t that committee, I, I was right on. I know you were. I'm right on it. I know you were. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mayor. I just want to add to what Bruce just said. I've heard everyone, just about everyone who came up to the microphone and they spoke and they said, some people are of the opinion that we don't need your help that it's us to fix the problem. I live here too, I pay taxes, I'm a part of this community, and it takes us to fix the problem. Thank you. It's Alex. not just 
you people up here making the decision. It's all of us that's going to change it. It takes us to make that change. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Sophia McDermott Hughes. I live at 330 South 3rd. Hi, my name is Michelle. Uh, oh, Michelle Fan. I live on South Fifth Avenue, um, and I'm currently going to Rutgers. I graduated from Highland Park, though, and we both know Mary. Okay, yeah. and, and please speak into the microphone so the cameras can hear you. Um, so just a preface for everyone who has spoken, I'm covering this for the Highland Park Fling. It's a student newspaper, and we're trying to get more distribution town-wide. So especially if you wrote down <laughs> remarks, I'd really appreciate it if you gave those to me. Um, and if you're willing to interview, be, have an interview, I'd love if you approach me. Um, so uh, I think Mark mentioned it before. Um, there are 20 Highland Park High School alumni um, and uh, students who are here. Um, you know, we've shared this throughout the school. It's definitely something, a conversation. And for those who can't be here since it's late, since there are concerns about the weather, um, there's definitely been an outpouring of both support and, uh, and outrage about this incident in the high school. Um, there also were, are two teachers. Um, some of the, the, Mr. Gold had to leave, and some of the students had to leave too because it's getting late and concerns about the weather. Um, but even though Amiri left the uh, high school, I think two years ago, Everyone remembers him because he's an incredible kid. I mean, he's a year older than me, and I grew up just absolutely admiring him. He's incredibly eloquent, so approachable, so charismatic, and everyone loves him. And I think that's important to know, but it's also not important to this incident because that doesn't factor into it at all. What's important is that he's black. Actually, that day, um, so when he came to visit the high school, he visited uh, the Model UN cl uh, Club, which I was at. We were having a debate, actually, on gun violence and gun control. Um, myself and another uh, high schooler, both of us are white girls, uh, walked with him. Um, and we split off because he went north and we went south. Um, in contacting him, he said that this incident happened five to ten minutes after um, he separated with us. And I think it's very fair to say that were we still with him, he would not have been followed. Um, none of us were followed. Um, and I, I just like responding to what the police chief said uh, earlier respectfully, uh, when you said, you know, there's heightened security because of these um, incidences and anyone taking pictures would um, be suspect. In this age of like, cell phones and social media, Teenagers are constantly taking pictures of themselves and their surrounding and public spaces. I constantly do it too. I have never been questioned because of that. Not in the past weeks with heightened security, none of that. I have, that's never been an issue. Uh, I wasn't followed that day. Um, I wasn't questioned. I was also walking alone and taking pictures of my surroundings um, and in the same area as Amiri. Um, I didn't even walk through my front door. I went through the side. I went back through my house before. So that, you know, that's definitely caused for more suspicion than someone literally walking with no resistance through their front door. I've never felt afraid of the Highland Park Police Department or any police department. And that's, you know, walking home after school, that's walking in Highland Park by myself at 1 a.m. I had a, I've have actually been questioned by the police at 1 a.m. in Highland Park. Never was I afraid for my safety or even did it cross my mind that that should be a concern. Um, so I just object to this like conversation being it's because of it's heightened security and you know there's like concern because he was taking pictures because that's not the important part because that's not affecting me. Um, and I'm white and Amiri's black and I think that's the important distinction. Um, so I, I really, uh, what the last speaker really said uh, resonated with me. I think this is really important. It's a really a discussion that needs to continue and that like um, in the high school, as uh, Mr. Gold said, um, and that it has to be continued action, um, not only uh, on the part of the Highland Park students, uh, parents of students of color and organizations like that, uh, but of uh, people like me, um, like the students who are here today, uh, a lot of who, whom are white and aren't actually directly impacted from this, but our friends um, and our community members are, and that's definitely something important, and we need to continue this discussion. I think Michelle has some good words to end this on. <laughs> not make this too long. Um, 
Closer to the oh, microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, can you? Okay, good. Um, so two years ago, um, Amiri and I were on the same mock trial team together, and um, we both were playing police officers um, for our mock trial team. And Officer Curbello came in, um, or Sergeant actually, um, came in and he taught us about like the different mannerisms and like your demeanor so that you know you, you get like a lot of respect and you have this air of authority about you. And it was, it was really fun for me. It was really cool to kind of like step in those shoes. Um, and I'm sure it was really interesting for Amiri as well, a black boy to be stepping into the shoes of an officer, especially with, you know, this context that we're looking at this in. Um, and just, I think it would also be really interesting um, if the police department could possibly do the same and, you know, reverse that, try to step into the shoes that he stepped into two years ago, what it must be like to be walking home, visiting your friends and your old school, to be walking home and to be followed to have five police cars show up around your own house and make you feel like you don't belong there. And I think that maybe if you'd approach it with that mindset and try to step into his shoes like he did two years ago into yours, maybe it'd be a little bit easier to take that first step and actually admit that something kind of messed up was happening something that maybe we aren't always willing or completely able to articulate in words, but something that's definitely there. And just another note, um, kind of reiterating what speakers before me mentioned, um, this idea of like being woke, being socially aware, um, it's not like a button that you can like purchase at a store. You read a book and now you're woke. Now you get it, like you're, you're socially conscious and aware and like you know what racism is and you know how to stop it because you finally read it, you read the book and you got the button, right? <laughs> it's a process and it doesn't end. Once you commit to it, you can't, you can't stop. And so when people are coming to you and they're saying that this is a problem because this happened to my son, this happened to my best friend, this happened to a kid I didn't really know that well who went to my high school, but I know he's an amazing person. But more than that, he's a human being who deserves his shot at life. Um, when people are coming to you and they're saying that and they're expressing their concerns, I think the first thing isn't necessarily to say, well, look, we've done this. We have these steps in place, and you know we're we're already doing this. It's not. I'm saying this as respectfully as I can. Please try not to be defensive, and please, please don't be offended by us coming to you, because we're all proud Highland Park residents. But the most important part of being part of this community is that we're willing to admit that we kind of screwed up, and that we can be leaders of the rest of central New Jersey, of the rest of New Jersey, of the rest of the world even, if we're willing to take that first step together and say, yeah, this was messed up, we'll admit we do have issues with racial profiling because we don't exist in a bubble. But you know what? We're gonna be the leaders by taking that first step and admitting that we messed up and by listening to people who came here. Because again, it's not a button that you can purchase and it's not a book that you can say you've read. It's this process, and it's a process that we all have to be part of, and one that we can only be part of by admitting that we have things to work on. Thank you. So I want to, I want to, I want to thank the two of you for speaking. Um, you, you, our Highland Park young people continue to make me so proud of, of our community. Um, and I'm, and you know what I'm hoping uh, to pick up on what you were saying is what I'm hoping that this task force committee of understanding will do is make this process something that is an ongoing, regular process for us to examine ourselves uh, and for the officers to feel to better understand what um, Amiri or Monique might be feeling and also for them too to understand what's going on in the brains of our police officers at the same time. 
because if we don't talk to one another, then we're never going to get each other. Isn't it one comment on that? Um, I think one important thing that wasn't addressed yeah. there and what Michelle said is that point of, a, of admitting that this is an incident of racial, racial profiling. Um, respectfully, Mayor, I don't think you've ever said that. You only referred uh, to the fact that Amiri is black uh, once in this one time, and that was after um, having a, someone ad directly address it at you and, and responding to their comments. Um, so I think when you, like, the council is uh, asking, you know, saying, oh, we're open to suggestions and we're open to what the community wants. I think the first step in that is admitting that it was an incident of racial profiling uh, and actually using those words um, and saying that this is an issue that we have to combat because it's racial profiling. So please, please state your name and address. Hi, my name is... Uh my name is Francesca Maresca. I'm at 216 South 3rd Avenue. You could just tilt, just tilt it. it. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, there's a bunch of us that have been talking a lot about this. And, and like Catherine and like Monique, um, I am the mother of a, um, a child of color. And I think what I keep hearing tonight is that we need to communicate better and we need to build bridges. Um, I don't think it's about communication. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's about building bridges with our youth. I fully agree with Catherine about our youth, especially our children of color and our black and brown children not spending more time with the police. It doesn't matter how much time my soon to be almost teenager son is gonna hang out at that teen center because when it's dusk and when it's dark, it won't matter that he played basketball at the teen center with one of our officers, because that's not who he's going to see. He's going to see a threat. He's going to see a young black man, and that's all he's going to see. This is not about understanding cultures. This is about systemic racing policing in the year of 2018. In a state where 91% of our youth currently detained, as Kat mentioned, are black and brown, when research shows that black youth, both boys and girls, are perceived to be older much older than their peers, Tamir Rice. When black and brown children are punished more frequently and more severely than, our, than their white peers in our schools, how can anyone state that Highland Park is different? We are a microcosm of a larger society, not just in the state of New Jersey, but in this entire country. So what makes us so special that we could say that? I don't think we can. We have to stop putting the burden of decreasing racist and biased responses on the victims. We have to take responsibility for our own biases, which our youth have also said. Nobody here has mentioned biased policing, that this was a biased, racist response to a young man walking home, walking through his front door after visiting his friends at school, after seeing his teachers. Everybody has spoken about how wonderful Amiri is, and I believe them, but this isn't as about how wonderful Amiri is. This is about the fact that a young black boy, and he is a boy, was profiled and followed home, and the police officer never identified himself. The first step is admitting that we have these biases. I'm white, you may have noticed. Um, I had to face my own as the parent of a black child, and I continue to do this every single day. It didn't stop. It didn't stop. I didn't take a class. I didn't read a book, right? I didn't engage in Facebook slacktivism. That's what one of my students calls it, slacktivism. Um, every single day, when a young black man walking home triggers a police response of five police cars marked and unmarked, it really is time to acknowledge complicity. Catherine um, spoke briefly to me again. There is a power imbalance at work here. And it's one that maintains silence because people do not feel that they can speak up. So we have to look at who has the power in this town and who has the power to speak, but who feels safe enough to speak. I would say, and I could be wrong, and I don't want to speak for anybody, and I know there's people here who may have experienced this, but there may have been people who have experienced these types of racial profiling incidents and did not feel safe to say anything. And there's lots of reasons they don't feel safe. So much like Catherine too, and Monique, and you, and we have to talk to our kids 
I have very different conversations already with my eight-year-old. I explained to him what happened. I explained to him that one of the big boys got stopped walking home from school. And I told him why, though you may not agree with me. And his response to me now is, I'm afraid to walk outside by myself. I am not sorry, I told him, because I am preparing him for his reality. And this is his reality in Highland Park in New Jersey in 2018. Please state your name and address. Uh, I'm Rosa de Aguiar. I live at 217 Lincoln Avenue. You may want to lift the microphone a little. Um, should I say that again? No, I heard you, but I want the camera to be able to. Um, I'm in eighth grade. I'm close friends with Amiri Tulloch's little brother. Um, neither of them have ever displayed any suspicious behavior that would cause them to be approached by police, but it is the case, no matter how much certain members of the community would like to deny it, that they are at a greater risk of being profiled and potentially harmed by police officers. It is my opinion that speaking with police officers will not encourage progressive change. Where is your data? Why do you think that simply speaking to officers, like Officer Joe Cabello, who is almost a constant presence at the middle school, will, stop, will start to stop racial profiling in our town? Furthermore, considering the building of the teen center and recent sh school shootings like the one in Parkland, Florida, I don't see why there should be a strong p police presence at the teen center like Councilwoman Foster Dublin suggested. <coughs> I know for a fact that many of the middle schoolers, like my friends and I, that are around Officer Cabello, Cabello are already severely uncomfortable with the fact that he carries a gun with him at all times. Uh, going off of what one of the last speakers said about how, they, about how black youth are seen as much older than they are, Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, was considered a man. Nicholas Cruz, who was 19, was considered a helpless boy. I have noticed that during a lot of these speeches, a lot of the white people in the room have had glazed eyes, not truly listening because they will never understand the struggles that people of color go through. So it is imperative that you listen to me right now. Ms. Haley Locke used her, privilege, used her privilege in the right way tonight. She was allowed to get angry about these issues in a way that Ms. Coleman may have not been socially allowed to. And that is something that we also need to combat when talking about these matters. So uh, I'm, I just want, I'm going to, I'm going to, we have, we have two public discussion sessions. This is the first one. There is some, believe it or not, borough business that we have to get to. And then we'll open up the second session again. So um, if you, uh, it won't take us long to go through the, this borough business portion. Um, so if you still want to talk, please stay in line over there and we'll get to that right away. Okay. Clerk, could you report on advertising an ordinance for dissolution of the Highland Park Redevelopment Agency for consideration of passage on final reading by title? <coughs> an ordinance of the Borough of Highland Park County of Middlesex State in New Jersey dissolving the Borough of Highland Park Redevelopment Agency pursuant to NJSA 48-12A-24 and NJSA 48-5A-24. 5A-20 was duly advertised for consideration of passage on final reading by title and affidavits of publication are on file. The ordinance was posted and made available for public inspection as required by law. Okay, may I have a motion to take up the ordinance on final reading by title? Motion to take up ordinance on final reading. I'll second. Any public hearing on the dissolution of the redevelopment agency? Seeing none. Um, may I have a, a motion to adopt or reject and advertise the ordinance on, on final reading by title? Motion to adopt. Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Yes. Councilman George? Yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovich? Yes. Clerk, could you please report on introduction of the cap rate exception ordinance for consideration of passage on first reading by title? You skip one. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me do number 12. Um, clerk, report, could you report on introduction of the ordinance to amend the water and sewer ordinance for consideration of passage on first reading by title? 
An ordinance to amend and supplement the revised general ordinances of the Borough of Highland Park, Chapter 328, Sewer and Water, has been introduced in writing by the Public Works and Public Utilities Committee for consideration of passage on first reading by title. May I have a motion to adopt or reject and advertise the ordinance on first reading by title? Also move. Second. Okay, roll call please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Yes. Councilman George? Yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Abstain. <laughs> Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay. Clerk, could you report on introduction of cap rate exception ordinance for consideration of passage on final reading by title? First. first. On first reading by title. Calendar year ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank has been introduced in writing by the Finance Committee for consideration of passage on first reading by title. May I have a motion to adopt or reject and advertise the ordinance on first reading by title? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Yes. Councilman George? Yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. <coughs> Clerk, could you report on introduction of the 2018 municipal budget and tax resolution for consideration of passage on first reading by title? Be it resolved that the following statements of revenues and appropriations shall constitute the municipal budget for the year 2018. Be it further resolved that said budget be published in the Home News Tribune on March 28, 2018. The governing body of the Borough of Highland Park does hereby approve the following as the budget for the year 2018. General appropriations within CAPS municipal purposes, $12,744,753.69. Appropriations excluded from CAPS, $2,683,726.01. Reserved for uncollected taxes, 200000 Total general appropriations, $15,628,479.70. Less anticipated revenues other than current property tax, $3,058,055.23. Difference, amount to be raised by taxes for support of the municipal budget, $12,121,710.84. Minimum library tax. $448,713.63. Total water and sewer utility revenues, $5,458,087.90. Notice is hereby given that the budget and tax resolution to be approved by the Mayor and Council on March 20th, 2018, and a public hearing on the budget will be held on Borough Hall on April 17th, 2018 at 7 o'clock. Okay. Um, I want to thank the borough council members, all the department heads, and uh, <coughs> everyone who worked very hard in getting this budget in at a reasonable rate for us moving forward. Now, may I have a motion to adopt or reject the 2018 municipal budget on first reading by title? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Yes. Councilman George? Yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. May I, may I have a motion to adopt or reject a resolution to approve the budget transfers? Also move. Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Yes. Councilman George? Yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to the consent agenda. May I have a motion to adopt items number 16 through 24? I so move. Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Yes. Councilman George? 
I just want to comment to join um, Councilman Hirsch's comments and the comments uh, in the audience with regard to the support for the Safe and Responsible Driver Act. As a municipal prosecutor uh, in many towns, I run into the real everyday significant problem of people who are unlicensed and get picked up by uh, the radar of ICE and other organizations. And for years, um, those of us in my profession have had to engineer around uh, the offenses uh, which are committed, uh, but at the same time uh, bring more than undue punishment. I think this bill is long overdue. I think it should have been enacted three administrations ago. I strongly support it. I vote yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Um, I am appointing the following, Andrea Alexander to the Recreation Advisory Committee and Thomas Hillman to the Safe Walking and Cycling Committee. May I have a motion to confirm? Come Se on. Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Councilman George? Yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Um, I am appointing Jeff Perlman as alternate number one to the planning board. And um, clerk, would you re report on the election of volunteer firefighters? Received notification from the Highland Park Volunteer Fire Department of the election of Robert Howarth and Mario Diaz as volunteer firefighters. Okay, may I have a motion to confirm? Public so safety. move. Uh, he's not here. <laughs> yes, I'll so move. Public safety? Yes, second. Okay. <laughs> um, roll call, please. Councilman Fine? Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Yes. Councilman George? Yes. Councilman Hirsch? Yes. Councilwoman Kim Chohan? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay. Um, public discussion part two. Please, if you have something to say, please step up to the microphone and state your name and address. Move the mic close to you so we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, 113 Johnson Street. My name is Adam LeBell McLean. Um, when I recently heard about the events involving Amiri, um, I was, you know, immediately disturbed because I know Amiri through the Model Congress and Model United Nations Club at the high school, but I, I'm not here really to talk about uh, Amiri and the person he was. Uh, I'm here to discuss something that was said earlier at this meeting. Um, the council recommended that um, parents of students of color or students of color um, speak to police officers here after the meeting or, or at some point, and uh, and that that really that hit me as racial profiling in a public setting because I think that uh, if you were going to tell students of color and the parents of students of color to meet with police officers or speak to them, you should be telling all high school students that really if you're not going to discriminate based on race. Uh, I know that as a white student at the high school, I'm 18 years old, I, I've never felt unsafe in Highland Park. I've never worried about being followed. I've never, I've never asked myself, what would I do if I were stopped by the police? And I acknowledge that is my privilege and that that, that is something I am really upset by, that somehow I have this 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 image in my head that if I am stopped by the police, I have done nothing wrong. But that if Amiri, someone who is black, who has more accomplishments than I do, and who I think of as, as a very well-spoken, uh, intelligent young man, for him, to be, for him to be stopped going in the, ha uh, the front door of his own home, that, that's, that is absurd in my mind. And for then the council recommend that students of color speak to the police and not recommend that I speak to the police or that other high schoolers speak to the police. That is ra racial profiling in public. That is racial profiling uh, for all the people here to see. And, and it really, it hurts me to know that we are able to do that and, and continue that. So I want to thank you for your comments. Um, I'm sorry if it came off that way. I hope that everyone speaks to Officer Joe 
Um, he is trying to uh, do his best to meet with all the students and um, uh, the, uh, the parents of students of color is one of the groups that he should be we meeting with. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, good evening. My name is Sonia Hedlum. I live at 133 Benner Street. Um, I am a fairly new resident to Highland Park. I've been here for about three years. And um, I just want to first acknowledge, a I just want to acknowledge Monique and thank her for what bringing this issue to this council meeting tonight. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the young people in the room. I'm just so tremendously impressed with with all of you, it, it just fills me with emotion to hear you all speak, and um, it just gives me such hope for for the future. So thank you so much to you guys for being here. Um, and kind of piggybacking on what this young gentleman just said, <clears throat> I don't want to be here, um, but I have to be here. I have to be here because I am a black woman and I have a three-year-old son <clears throat> that I plan to raise in this community. I have no choice but to be here. And Mayor, your committee that you thank, I'm very happy that you're planning a committee. I will be on your committee. I thank am you. signing up for your committee. Thank you. It is a burden that black people in this country have had to carry, and we will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. We will continue to do so. I have no choice because what happened to her son, it could have been my family, and I do not want this happening again. I also want to say that we've talked a lot about bias. Bias is something, and you know, one of the things that, that worries me about current society is how much finger pointing we do. All of us, every single one of us has bias. Black people ourselves, we have to deal with what it means to live in a white society. From you're a child and you look in the mirror and you see your black skin and you wonder, how could I be considered a beautiful person? We have been dealing with bias ourselves from we are children growing up. So if we're dealing with it and you think because you're a liberal, you think because you're the parent of a, you're married to somebody that's black or a person of color? No, that does not, it, or because you put on a uniform, because you're a judge, because you're a lawyer, because you're a social activist, you don't carry bias, you are sorely mistaken, and you are contributing to the problem. Mm -hmm. Part of what we have to do is acknowledge what is within ourselves. We cannot change unless that happens. We cannot change unless that happens. One other last thing I'd like to say is a personal story. And I bring up this story not because I'm trying to point fingers, not because I'm trying to place blame, but I'm trying to show the face of reality of being black in Highland Park and the fear that black people carry of the police. I Around the time of Philandro Castile, when he was, in my opinion, murdered by the police, it was a highly volatile time. The community here had their night out, the police right. community night out. Right. And I, with a lot of trepidation, went to that event because I was so disturbed when I saw that footage of that man being murdered. Mm -hmm. I, and I just thought to myself, how are we going to fix this? You know, look at this beautiful thing. I live in this community where they are they're making an effort. And I, let me tell you, thank you for that. Thank you. I'm not, I'm, I mean that. Thank you. But that evening, I left my son, and this is a very minor incident, okay? I'm not bringing this up as if I went through some traumatic experience. I left my son sitting on the curb with a group of children. He was three, walking, little guy. Went to the hot dog stand to get some hot dogs. Knew I was gonna be carrying a plate of hot dogs. As I get up to the table, 
my son, I see him get up. He's just right, I mean, I'm talking, this isn't far. You know, the, the hot dog stand is here. My son's sitting on the curb right over there. I see him get up, and he starts walking towards me, which puts him behind the hot dog stand. As a mother, if you see your child start wandering off, there are a lot of people around, my instinct was to walk around the hot dog stand to, to attend to my son. And if any of you are parents in the room, you will understand when you have that thing, when you're like, I'm just paying attention to, I'm, I don't care what, I'm not paying attention to anything else right now. Well, as I tried to move forward, I had someone, I heard someone, again, I'm looking, I'm just watching him. I hear someone saying, ma'am, you're not allowed behind the hot dog stand. And I'm saying, oh, okay, but I'm just, and I'm trying to see, like, you know, he's, he's three, he's just kind of toddling around. <laughs> and I, you know, my instinct was to just move around, but I couldn't do it because I had someone telling me not to. But at some point, I was like, I need to move around to grab him. And when I did, I had a man in front of me, puffed up chest. I said, you're not allowed back here. And that's when the fear came into me. And I was like, oh, this is serious. Like, I thought I was just walking around a table at a community event, but this seems to be much more serious. I looked the, I looked the man in the eye and I said, I'm just trying to get my son. And it was like that energy of, that energy. I don't know if you guys know aggressive energy, but it went like that. No, in fact, actually what I said was, why don't you, will you grab him for me? You grab him. Because I was so scared. I was like, clearly I'm not allowed back here. I don't know, there was no grill, there was no, but anyway, I wasn't allowed back here. And Later, when I, you know, so he, and it, it, it immediately dissipated, and I grabbed, he was like, oh, go ahead, you know, it's okay, go ahead, get him. But as a black person, when something like that happens, you think, if I was a white woman, would that have happened? Would I have been treated like that? Second thing, an event that you, I'm sure all of you are hopeful would bring black, I will never, never go back to a, that community event. Because just like some of the people that have said here, what you realize is, is that when you, are view, when you are never given the benefit of the doubt, when you are always looked at as suspicious, you are putting yourself at risk by exposing, mo encouraging more interaction. Even at an event that is supposed to be encouraging that. So I bring this up tonight for you all to reflect on that. To think about, is that the outcome that you wanted? I doubt it, and I know that. That's not what you want. That's not what I, that's not what I would want either. And if there's anything I can do to help, I will be there. And thank you so much to you for, for your, because like I said to Monique, I'm meeting Monique face to face for the first time. I don't even know her. I am here because her story is my story. That's why I'm here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, there is a sign-up sheet for that committee up here, and I would love to see you there. Hello. Good, uh, hello. Yeah. Um, my name is Lynn Fryer. I live at 314 Wayne Street, and I'm apologetic that I arrived late, but um, wanted to tell my story of a, kind of a tale of two boys. Um, I have a son who's 15, sophomore at the high school, um, and about a month ago, my wife got a call from Officer Joe saying, can you meet me at the high school and can you bring Luke? And I, it was my wife, not me. I don't know the specifics, but the two of them went down to the police station and it was in reference to some recent car burglaries that had happened the previous weekend. And someone um, had identified or thought that my son resembled one of the people in a grainy video that um, had been captured by somebody's home security camera. 
so they went down. Son was scared. Wife was, but both of them were clueless. But they went down, and um, from what I heard, the interactions were all very, um, you know, professional, and um, you know, kind of. We're just asking questions. We would just want information. Anyway, it was not traumatic. Um, fast forward a week later, and we got a call from a detective at uh, Highland Park Police Department, and they wanted us to return with Luke. And this time, um, my, I went with my son and my wife. And um, we spent about 20 minutes talking to a detective, and again, all very um, very up and up. Um, Luke was concerned and scared. We were concerned and, and worried, but never threatened, never, never coerced, never, never disrespected. So anyway, I missed a lot of the earlier talk and I can only imagine some of the other stories that were told, but um, this is white privilege in my in my opinion, and initially when the story was being told, I, um, I was saying, well, my son had a brown boy moment, but my son had a white boy moment, and a brown boy moment would have looked a lot different, and um, it, it hurts me, I, you know. They're all kids, and they all deserve to be treated like the kids they are, so that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Maladnik. I live at 216 Graham Street in Highland Park. I'm also a teacher in the middle school. And um, I'm actually just coming with a resource um, that um, I think Councilman Hirsch and Mr. Morgan maybe were responsible for this, um, bringing this to, to me. Uh, one of the best things that, I think the oh. best, um, the best speaker that I've ever um, listened to, um, the best facilitator, when it comes to really getting me to reflect on my own bias um, was this woman. I kept the card because it was, um, the woman's name is Elizabeth Williams Riley. Um, it was, I think it was the 9-11 mm -hmm. event. Was that, was that what it was, the 9-11? Yes. Yeah, she's from the American Conference on Diversity. She, she spoke at the 9-11 event. She yeah. was incredible. She, and was. she really got me, you know, when she put up those questions and I was actually si um, sitting by a former student of mine and, um, and we had a great, we ended up be having a great conversation, um, and she really got me to reflect on a lot of my own bias, and um, you know, just getting you to think about your earliest messages and those sorts of things, and and it it, it was powerful and um, a good start, and I think it's something. I think she's a, the kind of person that could be brought in, um, you know, as a resource. Um, one thing that was a little bit troubling to hear is that. You know that there's not the budget for for this, like to, that we have to just get bring in free presenters because. Uh, oh, no, that was for training for the police. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that, there, I find but that there, troubling. But there, but there are, there is, there are other organizations and budgets for uh, bringing someone in to facilitate, for instance, through the Human Relations Commission. For the police. For whatever we decide would make. Okay. The well, I mean, I think better. that's the topic. Right. Yeah. So, and, um, and, and I do want to say, if, if I could, I was also very, very taken with her presentation, and I often think of the two words that she had us compare, equity and equality. Mm -hmm. um, that those are two very important, distinct right. words. So, so I guess, so yes, thank I, you. I agree. And, and really getting you to reflect on, like, because as Michelle said, and as other speakers have said, like, you know, bias, it's, it's, something that's we have and we have to deal with it and we have to really really dig deep and 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 be working on it mm -hmm. and it's something that I'm working on and I know I'm not done and um, so anyway let's whatever it costs um, because I don't think she's that pricey but she was good um, and I, I think that if we should be able to find some money to to uh, bring her in and yeah. you know continue that work thank you Mayor. Mayor, may, may I, may I, yes, may go I just ahead. respond? Thank you, Dan. Um, so yeah, we, we, we're, we've actually spoken with Elizabeth and 
uh, um, meeting with her um, next week, sorry, uh, to talk about um, uh, her ha having her here quarterly because she's her, her workshop, she, she does corporate, municipal, public sector, private sector, public forums that really help deconstruct uh, the issues that we're facing and really give us a new understanding of some of the things that are inside of us and some of the external elements that, that, that we're facing. And also one of the things, and this is kind of ironic that I'm saying this, but one of the things that really struck me with her too was that um, she had this acronym, uh, WAIT, W-A-I-T, which stands for Why Am I Talking? <laughs> so our job tonight here is to, is, to, is to be up here and listen and empower um, and, and, and she will be back, and, and uh, I look forward to that. Thank you right. for bringing that up. Right, and, and I do want to make it clear that um, the police have their own budget for training um, for their officers, which is separate from what we have as uh, mayor and council. Okay, last speaker. Um, my name is Olivia Estes, and I live at 311 North 4th. Um, Madam Mayor, you and I have both heard the same speeches tonight, um, and I think what we both really want to hear, what I think all of us on behalf of the students want to hear is that you guys are publicly condemning racial profiling in Highland Park, and I, we need you to acknowledge that this is a blatant act of, of racial profiling. I live two blocks away from Amiri, and I have never feared walking home from school. I have never thought that I was going to get stopped despite burglaries or whatever is happening in our neighborhood. So why, why, do I, why does my friend have to worry about that? And if you can take anything out of, I under, understand that there are gonna be committees and other actions taken, but you need to understand that this need, there needs to be an acknowledgement that this happened and what happened on Thursday night was an act of racial profiling. Okay, do any of our council people have anything that they want to say at this time before I close? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> go to, you go. Um, oh, are you talking back down there? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, I have nothing prepared, um, but clearly what happened the other day hit a nerve. Um, some of the stories that I've heard tonight are the first time I've heard some of them. Mm -hmm. um, is Jessica still here? I didn't, I didn't know you even had that information. I had no idea you were working on it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I would very li much like to see what, what you come up with. Um, so. Even if it's not perfect, get that report done and get it to us as soon as you can. Um, so, so it's all very disturbing. Back in 2002, we did have a cultural diversity action plan from Elizabeth's um, organization, the American Council of Di No? Who did it was that? A, it was another organization was, oh, right. I used. Oh, it was okay. a young man by the name of Robin Parker. We used right. his organization to do okay. that report. Um, I, I, I don't know that we had any preconceived notion of exactly what would transpire tonight and what the dialogue would be. I think we had some idea. Um, but I think that the purpose was to hear what y'all had to say and what steps we should be taking. You know, give us advice if we're missing something. Um, tell us what, what you think, what, you know, what direction you'd like to see us go in as a community, not just a governing body, but what direction we should be going into. Um, and, and, and what we should be looking at in achieving. What I'm hearing is we need a lot of help with, with, with racial profiling and with how to address this in our community and to have, have a plan that's ongoing and that we can build upon year after year. And, and those are just some of my thoughts. And, okay. and I'd like to see us, if it's through this committee um, or whatever, in whatever capacity we could do something <laughs> like this, I think it's super important. So that's all I have to say. Anybody else have anything they want to yeah, say? Yeah, I have one thing to say. For um, this is actually, like Susie said, my first time hearing um, from some of the students here some of the concerns that they had about Officer Corbello having a gun inside the school. Um, I think if at any time you guys feel uncomfortable, you can reach out to any one of us here. There. 
the mayor is here at what three times uh, Tuesday Wednesday Thursday a week um, I <laughs> I'm a council person that's in their 20s that sits on this dais. I can relate with you guys. So please reach out to any of us and I will make sure your message gets conveyed to this council so they can see what you see in the high school. Anybody else have anything they want to say before I close? I, uh, Go ahead. I just want to say that I've, I heard each and every one of you that spoke, the spoken and on the unspoken words, and we do have work to do. We do have much more work to do. And um, I am more than willing to work with other PDs, with residents, with other organizations to get us to where we can be on a better footing, a better working relationship with all the departments in our borough. We all live here and we all have to be our brothers and sisters keeper. So the more that we take a look at ourselves and, and to find ways to, in which to improve communication <clears throat> amongst all, all the groups, not just the PD, but within ourselves too. Because just like Bruce said, he was outraged when somebody said to him, we want to know what your formula is. That's bias within itself. And I've heard that many times from people say, oh, what did you do so wrong? What did you do so right? Your son is teaching in China. That's so great. Tell me what's your secret. Well, isn't that bias for you to look at me and ask a question like that? What did you do so right? So, you know, we all have our own biases like someone else said. So we need to, it's, it starts within us to make, the, to fix some of the problems that we see. I'm not trying to get away from what happened this weekend and where we need to be as a council and where we need to be as a borough and where we need to be as our PD. But we're saying we're, there's some self-introspection that we have to do as well. But you can't look at us sitting up here and say, this is your problem. We elected you. You fix it. It takes all of us to make it happen. And, and we're all sitting and I'm, here. And I'm asking for your support, and, most importantly. Go ahead, and we're all sitting here because we want to help. We're not... That, that's why we're here. So please, you know, tell us what, what, what direction you want us to go in. Okay. Mayor, I have, may, may, I, may I just say one, one, one more thing, another, another <laughs> wait, why am I talking uh, uh, moment. Um, it is important to, to remember that we're, that, you know, we're here, I think we're all in this room because we want to help, we want to improve our community. We want to make, we want to, we want to take the shape of our ideals. Um, and, the one thing that, you know, I, I'm not in my 20s, but I can relate to the students in the room, too. That's right. Yeah. He, I, 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 I don't know what being in my 20s can, can relate, so, but I can relate. I don't know. I can well, relate because, a, because I, was on my, I was in my school paper. I used to cover board meetings. I used to speak out, too. And, I, and, 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 you learn, and you learn really quickly that when you participate and when you show up and when you, and you, and when you demand, you know, accountability on your public officials, that you can help shape the, your, the, the, yeah. you, you, you can help you can help your community take the shape of its ideals, which is really important. Now we don't I, no, no one expects everybody to be here um, you know at every meeting, but I will say that you know one of the and, and I think I can speak for everyone up here is that is that one thing that I find particularly invigorating is to walk into a full room regardless of what the topic is, even if we know we're going to get it handed to us, even if we know it's going to be you know all 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 roses you know it's 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 just. When you know that the community is paying attention, when you know that people are willing to be here and participate and help us solve problems, you know the six of us can't can't solve can't 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 solve the problems of of, of a community of fifteen thousand. We need help, and and our 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 job is to help put into place maybe you know pathways to 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 help solve those problems, but specifically to empower and and really and really show that you know you can 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 help can help the community take take the shape of its ideals. Um, I don't trust an empty room at a municipal meeting. I used to be a regular journalist. I used to walk into I used to walk into to, to, to council meetings and board of ed meetings. And if it was empty, I'm like something's wrong. Right. Because you know what? Nothing is ever perfect in any community. Nothing. And there are serious, serious problems that we need to address. But we can't do it alone. Um, and it's really important that you're here. It's really important that we're hearing from you. And it's really important that we all work together to to. To address to, to address these, these these very serious issues, particularly in this time, nobody should be walking around. I mean, I have three kids; they're all younger than you. 
but nobody should be walking around feeling uh, fe feeling unsafe and unsure of, about approaching any municipal agency. That was the whole reason for our, for our inclusive community fair, fair and welcoming policies, was to make people more aware, not, not, not have it be in their face, but more aware and more and, and, and more and more and, and make municipal agencies more approachable. And so we do have a lot of work to do. And I just thank you for being here and I hope this room's not empty, you know, a lot. Again. And you're thank all here you. in a snowstorm. Right. Yeah. Th th uh, thank you, Mayor, Matt. Did you want to say something? <coughs> I like the rule and I listened very clearly to what she said. Wait, why am I talking? Um, I have a somewhat different perspective um, as a prosecutor, as a trial lawyer, as a, and with all due respect, chief, a municipal attorney who terminates police officers for bias, prejudice, uh, racial assaults, uh, and other matters. So uh, for the last 35 years, I've generated something of a different perspective. Um, I embrace my bias. I embrace my prejudice, they're two different things. I embrace them because it's taught me how to be good at what I do, how to be good as a parent in an interracial marriage who's performed the experiments of saying, you go, you go over there to shampoo, I'm gonna stand and watch from prescriptions and watch what they do. And sure enough, Mr. Lewis to IL-5, which is the security code, for a black person stealing something and watched it and then had the extreme pleasure of having that same store come to me to prosecute their shopliftings and saying, I'm sorry, you don't have enough here. A little bit of revenge, but that's my track record. That's what I listen to. I've learned from my bias and I've learned from my prejudice and I've listened to the conversations and uh, I echo what some other people have said, even people in the audience. It's all of us. Because you may not like what we put together. You may not like 15 different commissions and boards and committees that are gonna talk about the same thing and talk about it and talk about it. Councilwoman Foster Dublin mentioned something very interesting the, the human uh, relations study that was done so many years ago, that was spearheaded by the first two African-American women ever elected to this council, ever. And she knows the other one who happens to be my wife of 20 some years. And they put it together and they fought and I was the prosecutor at the time, prosecuting cases that were blatantly racial and taking corrective actions behind the scenes. So I can tell you, as Councilwoman Foster Dublin can do, how far we have come since that was done. Um, yeah, I, I see Mr. Morgan shaking his head. He knows where we were. We weren't the Deep South. We weren't, uh, uh, you know, Los Angeles. Uh, but we had our own problems and they hadn't ever been addressed. They have been addressed, but the focus is not to have 20 different boards. The focus is to have the commissions, the boards, the groups, the conversations that focus on the problems that get it done. I remember speaking to the LGBT community after the Orlando shooting, and I told them the one most important thing, the only thing, the only thing that will cure it is not a damn thing that we can sit up here and do and not a damn thing that you can say at the microphone. What counts is how you live it. And you know the great thing about it? So I'm 68 years old and when I'm dead that's one more white guy gone because who's going to fix it is that generation. That generation. That's who's going to fix it because they're not living the crap that I was brought up with. They're not living the crap that you were brought up with. They're living their own lives. And you know what? Highland Park is one of the few places in my experience, and I represent 20 or 30 towns. I represent the downtown ghettos. <laughs> I represent the bad neighborhoods. And I represent a couple of really fancy overprivileged white places too. And I can tell you the change is gonna happen from them. It's not gonna happen 
from any border commission. It's going to happen what I told the LGBT community. You're in a coffee shop, you're in OQ, you're in Ruthie's, you're anywhere else, anywhere, it doesn't matter where it is, downtown North, downtown Patterson, downtown Camden, put down the phone, turn to your neighbor and say, what's up? How you doing? I'm from Highland Park, where are you from? Start a conversation, two minutes of conversation, one hello, how you doing? Talk to your neighbor, put down the phone, Say hello, because we're not going to fix it, and you're not going to fix it. Then you're going to live it. You're going to do it, and it's that generation, and it's that generation that's going to fix it, because they're living it. Highland Park is an incubator for that. Let's never forget that. For all our diversity that causes our problems, our diversity is the cure to fixing them. And it's never going to get fixed by us all feeling the same. It's going to be fixed by having our own prejudices and our own biases, but having grown up with people like that, that are like us or not like us, that it changes it. That's what will change it. Thank you. Josh, did you have anything to say? Just to say that I, first of all, want to thank my fellow council members, my colleagues, for everything they said. I agree with it. Um, I would say that. Most importantly, I want to thank everybody who came out tonight um, to echo what Councilman Hirsch said. We need to see you here, and, and, and we need you to help us out um, in terms of fixing, or if not fixing, at least working on issues together. And we hope that we can, uh, we can count on you to continue coming out and to continuing really uh, doing, making our community as be the best it can be. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, you had yes. Go ahead, Monique. Thank you. This won't be long since it's so late, but I think just for my own sake here and trying to bring this all together um, and going forward with this committee or commission, you know, what's the timeline? I, I just feel like, again, this is life or death <laughs> type of right. talk right. we're having here. Right. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to see this drag out. I want right. to know, I know you said the commission would be the best body to determine whether or not. Or make a recommendation. recommendation yeah. Yeah. I, but uh, I'm just wondering, do we have any sense of agreement here? And I don't, you know, do we all kind of think that we need this comprehensive, mm -hmm. you know, review at this mm -hmm. point, this audit? And this is urgent. <laughs> right. Because you, you've heard what the ACLU data is. So, you know, I think we see that there's an issue, but I think it's obviously behooves us to really, as a township, admit and say, we need to start now with getting this um, comprehensive plan in motion, whatever you need to do in terms of facilitating that process as quickly as possible.